Uh, good to be uh, back in terms of the uh, year ahead of us. Um, we have a significant, although a small agenda today, significant issues to deal with. Uh, Councillor Goff. Hello, Councillor Goff. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Happy New Year. Morning, Councillor this, is, this is the first. This is the first but that we've ever had since uh, the rules were changed that allow a councillor to attend a council meeting uh, by audio visual um, or audio alone and on this occasion it's audio alone looking good Jamie mm -hmm. um, and uh, <laughs> Feeling good. but this is a reminder to everyone to use your microphones uh, Jamie won't be able to participate in the meeting uh, fully if uh, he can't hear you so it's really important that you switch on your microphones uh, when you're um, commenting uh, the next item, uh, so, so he's not an apology, I'm just simply saying that, so do I have any apologies and I don't because he is now regarded as part of the meeting. Uh, declarations of um, interest, uh, there were no declarations of interest of bias prior to the meeting. Uh, and uh, now we move on to public participation and the public forum and I've been advised that flip out Christchurch, Andrew Moss would like to come and speak to the council. Good morning. Thank you everyone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, come and talk to the, um, uh, to the council today. Um, I have a presentation which I'm going to go through very, very quickly. Um, it's a two-part thing. It's a background of, of what, what flip out actually is. And then uh, there's an issue that I have with some flooding that I'd like to, um, uh, to bring up with you as well. The flip out is, uh, is in Bromley. It's been open for about a year and a half now, and um, it's quite a, a been a successful uh, venture for for the east side of Christchurch. Um, I'll just whip through some of these. Uh, I know you have these um, already on on your iPad, so you could uh, you look at them. But we have a mission, and there's our uh, our the things that we want to have in the mission. Uh, here's the uh, facility itself, 1,700 square meters uh, facility. It has a wide range of uh, different surfaces uh, that uh, people can bounce on. Um, and we also have supporting things like cafes and on-site uh, uh, Wi-Fi. We have 65 on-site car park spots as well. Last year, we had about 75,000 visitors. Um, we, have, uh, we employ 12 staff. And we're moving towards uh, making this a, a venue for um, entertainment uh, in a broader sense, not just uh, as a trampoline arena. So we have live bands that play there, uh, break dancing, uh, circus performance, that sort of stuff as well. Uh, this is a quick view of the inside of the uh, facility. If you haven't been there already, I do recommend you just even come and have a look. It's, uh, it's, it's very visually impressive. Um, here's some of the investments that we have put into the facility. It's about $1.3 million in the fit-out. Uh, the, the building itself uh, was about $7 million of remediation after the earthquake. We have about a $265,000 payroll uh, per year. Uh, it's been a three-year project for me so far, and we're on an eight-year lease. Uh, we involve a lot of uh, community groups, school groups, and um, other groups, and uh, use this facility quite extensively. Sorry, it's taking a little second for it to come. There we go. Um, we're trying to uh, expand what we're doing to keep it interesting for everyone. Uh, we have... Um, we have... Uh, activities for all ages, all abilities. Um, as you can see here, um, we have kids from one years old. This, this boy is just starting to learn to walk, and uh, we have uh, you know, quite, quite uh, high-end people as well in there. Special programs, we do offer a lot of courses, classes, uh, activities uh, for, again, a wide range of, of people. One of the next things that we're going to uh, incorporate into Flipout is, is technology at Flipout, and that's really bringing technology into the, uh, the environment. Uh, so things like the Internet of Things will be put into Flipout to make it uh, more, um, 
uh, stimulating uh, for the people that are actually doing the physical activity. Um, we're looking at some uh, image capture technologies as well and some VR technologies as well. Uh, so over the next few years, we have some uh, good plans to bring that sort of technology into FlipUp. We are a good community citizen. Uh, we do a lot of uh, outreach programs with um, uh, festivals that the city council uh, organizes. Um, we go out to schools, bring uh, air tracks and, and uh, coaches out to help uh, kids um, learn some of these activities. We do host clubs at Flip Out, parkour clubs, slackline clubs, martial arts and breakdancing clubs, all are resident at Flip Out. This is the, uh, the event that I'd like to uh, bring up with you t today, and it's uh, to do with flooding. Um, on, our, on the rain events, we do have, um, it is particularly busy for us. Obviously, not too many people want to go to the beach or the, the pool or other places, and so generally flip out becomes extremely busy during the uh, rain events. On a rainy day, we can have up to about a thousand people come through the facility in one day. Um, and unfortunately, right now, um, we have surface flooding that happens. Uh, last year, we had eight days of surface flooding. Uh, this is uh, surface flooding that goes right way across the road. It floods half of our property and, um, and makes the, uh, the operation next to impossible to run. Half of our car park gets uh, flooded, which means those 65 car park spots um, are irrelevant because uh, when we're busy, we need those car park spots and they're flooded. There's no, no uh, street parking when it's flooded. There's no cycle, uh, pedestrian, or accessible access to the facility when it's flooded. Uh, we have a loss of property, flooded cars, um, you know, cars that uh, have been parked in the, in the flooded area and they, they've been damaged. Um, of course, it's very dangerous, and after that, there's a huge cleanup exercise that we have to do after the event happens. All of our garden beds are all um, wood chips. So, of course, when a flood happens, all the wood chips get lifted up and then get spread around the neighborhood. This is a photograph of the actual event. Um, you can see in the, uh, in the center up, there's a, a cyclist who wants to come to flip out. There's no way that they can get there. Um, we have to move all of the cars from our parking lot where they're parked, and when the people walk back from the cars, of course, it's raining and they're getting soaked and they're not very, very happy at all. The impact on a business, uh, now we're getting to the point where people are phoning us up when it's raining, saying, is the, is the road flooded? If the road's flooded, I'm not coming. And uh, that's um, uh, totally unacceptable, of course. Um, I've talked a little bit about this already. Um, we have a high risk of flooding. You can see in the, in the first uh, photograph there, that's the tide line uh, where it's coming up to our building. Um, we have a $60,000 foam pit that's just on the other side of that door. If the, um, if the foam pit gets wet, uh, we'll have to replace the foam in there. And uh, that's a very big uh, risk, a very big concern for us, of course. If there is flooding inside, we will have to close the business for that day to do cleanup. And that's a huge impact on our revenue, of course. So I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, action, I think the action that's required is uh, allocate some funds and resources to correct this problem. It's been seven years where this problem has been existing in this, this, in this area. Um, we have brought this up to council um, uh, last year. Uh, there has been no um, action. Um, they have, uh, the council has uh, put pumps, uh, but the pumps have not been effective at all. Uh, we've had one day where they've They've pumped this water into the storm sewer, sorry, into the, uh, into the wastewater sewer, and that was reasonably effective. We got rid of the water after about an hour and a half. All the other activities have not done any, uh, the, the water stays there for seven or eight hours. Obviously, the kids' safety is at stake, and um, flip out, I think, has met all its obligations as far as um, the resource consent, um, being part of the community, adding a lot to the community, and uh, we think we've gone well beyond what we, uh, what we, the requirements that we need. We need good infrastructure to run this business. That's the bottom line. And right now, as you can see, it's, um, it's hindering us doing business in Bromley. That's all I have for today. But, uh, please, um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Sorry, Jamie. Um, these are not the best ways to raise these issues with the council because you get five minutes and I've allowed you obviously quite a lot over that. 
um, simply because you wanted to state your case. Um, my proposal is that we refer this to the Land Drainage Recovery Programme Working Group, uh, which Pauline Cotter chairs. She also chairs the Infrastructure, Transport and Environment Committee. I know that this piece of work is on the work programme, but I'll ask them to respond to you directly, if that's okay with you. So I, again, it's, it's just a concern of mine because we need some action. And that's what yeah, I'm looking no, for. and and uh, appreciate you. I mean, it is a channel that's available to you. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. The next item on the agenda um, is. No, no, I don't need a resolution. We can just um, make that happen. And we'll come back to council from the land drainage group. Mm -hmm. How do we get progress on this? It's been to community. Yanni, Yanni, don't do that. Um, the next person is Lindy Harwood, End of Life Choice Christchurch, regarding the End of Life Choice Bill. Um, okay, so in the 70s and 80s, I lived in Nelson and um, was a bit of an activist, was involved in Native Forest Action Council. Um, so a lot of our Native Forests are now there because we had stalls and we ran a, the huge petition, the Maria Declaration, which was the biggest ever in New Zealand at the time. Um, okay, so six years ago, I moved down to Christchurch and I found myself again in a bit of an activist role. I'm secretary of the End of Life Choice group in Christchurch. Um, as you, you'll know, David Seymour's bill has just gone through the first reading in Parliament and has referred to a Justice uh, Select Committee um, with deadline for submissions on the 20th of February. So we intend to run a few information stores between now and that date um, as part of a, a democratic process. Um, we know that 75% of people support this legislation in the polls, but they don't necessarily realise it's important to put in um, submissions. So unfortunately, it seems virtually impossible to find anywhere in Christchurch where you can legally hold an interactive information store, especially one that's deemed political as we are. So we've um, farmers markets, malls don't seem to be available. Um, street stalls, I think, are not legal. You do sometimes see um, <coughs> charities, but it's very rare to ever see any sort of um, activist type of stall. Um, if we try and put up information in libraries and community centres, they're now so inundated with information that they, it's impossible to guarantee that we can ever get anything in there. Um, you can't just go into a library anymore and ask them to put up information. It's all centralised and has to be distributed. And then if they don't have the space, they just don't put it up. Um, so the council website invites applications for permits or consents for amusement devices, mobile shops, street performers, hawkers and retail stores, as well as a one-hour speaking slot in Cathedral Square. Um, you do sometimes see information stalls of a political nature at uh, our rare rallies like the TPPA one or climate change. Um, but those aren't, um, this isn't what we seek. What I'm asking is where are the outlets for interactive promotion of ideas, ideals, questioning around issues of social importance and encouragement of public debate. There seems to be such a fear of upsetting people if they don't agree with you. Um, but I would say clearly everyone has to be allowed to promote their own particular views, and I recognise that means people that don't agree with me. Um, please don't say Facebook. You know, we're not all into social media, and I think it, uh, especially older generations. Um, by not having these outlets, freedom of speech is limited, and we depend increasingly on trying to force media interest in order to get coverage with the risk of bias of any non-conformist ideas. I'm talking freedom of speech, democracy versus PC, and dislike of any messy controversy. I do believe that it is the council's obligation to facilitate or enable that process of allowing the unimpeded right to inform and be informed. 
My recommendation is that there could be a few central spots made available around our city which would be suitable for stalls where the aim is to disseminate information, run a campaign, make a protest. Ideally, they would be sites with consistent local foot traffic, so not um, tourist centres. I don't actually believe the Cathedral Square is appropriate for this purpose. Um, covered and with easy car access or parking for conveyance of tables and display material. Um, one of my thoughts was possibly outside libraries. Well, look, th thank you very much, and um, uh, this was my suggestion that uh, you you come and make the presentation because I think in, in making it in the public, you've also um, highlighted the issue uh, which does need debate, um, and obviously there are questions and, and answers, and I totally understand your point around engagement. I mean, you can get engagement across social media, but as you say, not, that's not for everyone. So uh, it's an opportunity to actually have a conversation. We see a lot of um, groups in, in different places in the city in terms of um, stalls and things like that. There are options that are available and uh, libraries certainly do engage in, in some of these tough issues uh, from time to time as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask um, the head, head of the um, uh, Chief Executive's Office to, 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 to go with you and to talk through some of those options and, uh, and, and then if there are s still some gaps and things like that we can, we can have another conversation about that. But uh, it's great that you've brought this to the Council and, um, and obviously that is something that uh, we, we might get one of the, the committees to look at as well. But I think there are options available to you that perhaps um, you're not aware of and that will help get kickstart the process. I did actually speak to a member of Kafka um, because I happen to know him and he said they'd had the same problem. But anyway, yes, thank yeah. you. Okay, that's, that's great. All right, um, thank you very much. Uh, no deputations by appointment, uh, no presentation of petitions. Uh, so we'll move to the council um, minutes, the recess committee minutes and the health and safety committee minutes. Would someone like to move that they be um, confirmed and received? Um, yep, happy to move. Lynn, oh, <laughs> Jamie Goff. Jamie Goff seconded by Glenn Livingston. Time. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Um, and if I could move um, item number 16, which is the um, resolution to include the supplementary reports in the meeting. Um, so I will move that, seconded by uh, Andrew. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. And then I'll move on to um, items uh, uh, 8 and 9. So item 8 is the District Licensing Committee update of committee requirements. Would someone like to move that? David East, seconded by Tim Scandrit. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Uh, and the next item is the appointment of a hearings panel for the Summit Road proposed uh, prohibited times on road restrictions. And I won't have uh, councillors who are proposed to be part of the hearings panel to move this one. So uh, Phil Clearwater, seconded by Pauline Cotter, I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. And now we'll move on to the um, uh, below ground wellheads and drinking water supply status update. A little bit ahead of schedule, but that's, um, that's good. Um, Right, so, um, oh right, yeah, yeah, we, we were due to start this item in, in, a, in, a f in five minutes, so look, what I'll do is I'll just adjourn the, adjourn the meeting for five minutes, um, if people want to grab themselves a cup of coffee um, and bring it back, then that's fine, um, but we'll, we'll start on the dot of 10, 10 o'clock, thank you.
Heads and Drinking Water Supply Status Update Report and I'd like to uh, hand over to uh, John Mackey to um, commence with just a brief overview of the situation that we find ourselves in. Yeah, well thank you. Um, it'll come as no surprise to you the events of Havelock North in August 2016 and in response to that the whole industry has been looking very, very closely at the security of their water supplies across the country. So there was an inquiry established and um, they had two reports, stage one report from the Havelock North Inquiry came out in May uh, 2017 and we were very interested in those results and that le levels some criticism of a lot of parties involved in the, in the security of the, and the health of drinking water. Uh, the stage, from the stage one report we then took a very, very close look at the regime of looking at these wellheads, looking at our water security, our compliance with the drinking water standards with, the, with quite some rigour. And we called one of our technical people, made the inquiries of our contractors to say, look, what's the regime? You know, we want to make sure that we are still fully compliant with all of the stuff that was in the stage one report, which really related just to Havelock North. They hadn't addressed the rest of the country, the implications for the rest of the country, which was coming in stage two. Uh, the contractors came back and said, well, yeah, well, when we look at them in the light of what we've seen in the Stage 1 report, there are some things that we could be doing to improve them. So we got them to do an assessment of all of the wells around the city. They routinely go and inspect and maintain and check the pumps and check everything's working. Um, but again, this is just a routine operational thing that they've been doing for probably over a decade or more. Um, but we were looking at it through a new lens. And they came back with a whole bunch of recommendations that some of those uh, cable entry ducts uh, aren't as tight as they could have been. There's a couple of cracks in the concrete. There's water getting onto the floor of some of these things. So we said, like, guys, not good enough. You need to be putting in a program to, um, to improve all of those, those aspects. That's what they did. So they came back with a proposal to do a whole range of work on 103 boreheads. And, uh, and we put that in, in play. And we had some costings at that point, about $800,000, 200K in the current year, with the other uh, 600 in the following year. And that, that program started in July, August last year. And we've been monitoring progress, and City Care have been giving me weekly update reports because that's how seriously I was taking the, this issue. Fast forward uh, to uh, this December the 6th when the Stage 2 report came out and there was some 51 recommendations in that Stage 2 report and amongst the key ones for us uh, was that uh, they said they were recommending that we should have no longer have reliance on secure status of wellheads to meet the drinking water compliance. They had strong recommendations for mandatory uh, water treatment and, and chlorination. Yeah, but none of those have been accepted by the none government. None of those yet. expected by the government. So, so the, this, this, I, I, the real focus is yeah. the Ministry of Health yes, and so what, what that led And to. in one of those recommendations was um, that the, the Director General of Health uh, use the uh, powers under the existing legislation to um, get better compliance with drink water standards across the country. The Director General of Health then sent a statement on the 20th of December bringing that to the attention of all water suppliers that they should not rely on secure well status, they should consider uh, treatment until um, any recommendations had been uh, agreed by the government. We were considering that and we were preparing a paper for council after, the, after that event. In the meantime, technical staff had been going through their normal program of, of doing the independent engineering assessment of wellheads to com confirm compliance with the drinking water standards. So the consulting engineers, in the light of these reports that were very critical on, on one of their peers, a consulting firm, um, they are taking much more rigour in their assessment of the wellheads and they were reluctant to, to sign off on the wellheads. Um, so this was on the, around the 15th, 16th of December, the draft report that not even I had seen at that stage. Um, but they were having discussions with the drinking water assessor about what that meant. I arranged to meet uh, with the Medical Officer of Health and the Drinking Water Assessor on the morning of the 22nd of, of December. And it was at that meeting, uh, Alistair was on leave, Ramon Pink was the, the Medical Officer of Health at the time. Um, we said, look, there was the, the consequence of the Director General's letter and the, the reluctance of the professional engineers to sign off on the, on the wells meant that uh, that could imply that we no longer meet uh, the secure status, which was one of the three criteria for meeting the drinking water standards. 
And that's when we put the paper uh, to council. I wrote a paper, finished it that day, and, and sent it off to my general manager, copied in a, and the, the legal people, CEO, and um, suggested that this, is, this is, um, needs to be addressed. Um, with that time, you know, we were going into, um, into the Christmas period. I was planning to work through anyway, because there was still a lot of work to do. At the same time, we were reviewing our uh, water safety plan. And the water safety plan is a critical piece of, a, a critical document, because the water safety plan uh, is what gives assurance to the drinking water assessor that we are compliant with the, the, um, the drinking water standards. And uh, that's the means of which compliance is, is agreed. And uh, so we, during the break, we reviewed the water safety plan. I reviewed the business continuity plan. We got a whole lot of things up and running. I was getting weekly reports from CityCare, who gave me progress reports every Friday afternoon. And to date, they've completed seven of the whole program. Those seven, of course, are the most critical ones that we have in the city, and, and they're now completed. I'll hand over, so that's just a quick background to where we are, and I'll hand over to... Can I just, cause just to uh, emphasise just that period of time uh, when you had asked City Care to undertake a review of the uh, wellhead status, you were in uh, conversation with the Medical Officer of Health and the Drinking Water Assessor right throughout that period, so that's July, that's, August. That's correct. So one of the first initiatives, such a serious issue, we engaged with the Medical Officer of Health and the Drinking Water Assessor. In fact, we did a site visit, I think, early October uh, to, to look at some of the work. And also the Drinking Water Reference Group, which is the group that we set up in response to Havelock North, which is all of the five local councils, the CDHB, ECAN, um, and, and we share our knowledge and share experiences and share information. So that was one of the one of the things that was highlighted in the Havelock North report. That's not an issue for Canterbury. So the obligations under the drinking water standards, the three that we've highlighted in the report there, uh, in terms of relying on secure um, borehead uh, bore water status, that um, that is an ongoing obligation. It's not something that you have to comply with once a year and tick boxes. It is a uh, total 365 days a year obligation and if there are transgressions you have to report them and if there are um, breaches to the to the bore heads as picked up by a, an ongoing assessment then they have to be reported that, that that's correct so we every year we do we do a um, a report to the uh, the drinking water assessor on the the compliance with the drinking water standards uh, to the year ending june this last year it was forwarded in july and was reviewed and we got the feedback in, in August saying that everything was honky-dory at that point. We still had um, secure status and um, in fact, uh, the, and they were complimentary of the response, <coughs> the response that we'd taken to date on the, on the, on the drinking water inquiry. So, and, and that, that statement about the response to the drinking water inquiry, that was actually repeated in the letter of the 22nd of December last year? Yes, that, that's correct. So we've had a good, strong working relationship all the way through. It's, it's important to note that um, the quality of the drinking water has not changed. And so it still is as good as it ever was. Um, we manage that risk, we test it, we do more testing, bacteriological testing than, than we need to under the drinking water standards at the time. Um, so to, to give ourselves that assurance, because I'm well aware, as I reported in, in September 2016, that we have this residual risk in Christchurch where we do not treat the water. And that's the risk between the time we take a test and the time we get the results, which is 24 hours later. There is that 24-hour gap where if there was a contamination event, I wouldn't know about it. Mm. And that's my biggest concern, and that's why we actually have a very rigorous regime of water testing. But in um, July, August, when you're talking to the uh, drinking water assessor, the program of action that you've decided to take through City Care is sufficient to meet the ongoing obligation under um, Criterion 2. That, that's correct, so that was an agreed But position. that changed in December correct. 2017. That's right. Okay, thank you. All right, Alistair. Mate, can I hand to, yes. to the Medical Officer of Health, Alistair Humphrey, to, to get the, uh, the, 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 the public health uh, background on this? Okay, good morning everybody and thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, the first thing I want to say is that um, we, uh, in Christchurch, we're very proud of our water. We love our water. We know the difference between our water 
and everyone else's in the world because we occasionally get the opportunity to compare them. But from my perspective as a public health physician, I am also satisfied and have been satisfied for the 18 years or so I've lived here that um, Christchurch City Council as a supplier goes above and beyond what it needs to do to keep our water safe, notwithstanding that most of the time it doesn't treat the water. Christchurch City Council has always been responsible about keeping the community safe from problems with its drinking <coughs> water. Following the earthquake, very promptly the council took the decision to chlorinate the water. It was a temporary measure. It was vital that it was done and they did it. Um, the Christchurch community also participated in keeping themselves safe at that point. We remarkably had no gastro mm. outbreaks following the earthquake. That is very unusual. So you as the council and the council staff have been mindful of the safety of the water for as long as I can remember. And um, the first thing I will say about this is our routine responses as a community are what we are dealing with here. We are not responding to the Havelock North inquiry. That is very important to understand. We have in place a safe regime that has been there for a very long time. We comply with the drinking water standards. Uh, drinking water assessors and I oversee that and Christchurch has complied with the drinking water standards throughout. It is a routine process that the borehead security is, uh, is assessed and that's laid out in the paper you've got. Um, the boreheads are assessed in a rolling program once every five years, a fifth every year. And that is what has determined the change here. The, the independently commissioned engineers have come back and said that though they gave provisional status for a number of years, they could no longer give that provisional status. And that was their decision. As soon as they had made that decision, we were in a situation where we were being told, in effect, that there was no barriers to contamination for our drinking water. And as a community and as a supplier, the council have to respond to that. It's commendable that the council, in fact, had already responded even before they got that. And that's the, the, the work that John Mackey has already spoken about there already was in place a program to seal in those boreheads and also, as it happens, to deal with uh, the reservoirs, which were the, place, the only places where we had had significant transgressions in the past. So we have a water supply where there have been no transgressions, as far as I'm aware, except a few in the reservoirs where there were cracks. Part of the program was to deal with that as well. So the point here is that the staff at the City Council, the Council as a supplier, have been ahead of the game all the time. They were still ahead of the game, but the engineers told us in December that we no longer had um, secure status. Secure status, just to remind you, is dependent on three things. One, there should be no transgressions. There have been no transgressions. Two, the water should be aged appropriately, so old water is safe water. Um, a model was used to calculate the age of Christchurch's water, and it is indeed old water, therefore safe. The third criterion was where we failed, and as John has outlined to you, there were potential leaks in the system at the wellheads. Those have to be dealt with to make the water safe. So, following that report, um, we are in a situation where, sensibly, we should expedite that process if we can, the programme that's already been put in place. But in order to meet your obligations under the drinking water standards, it is important that there is another barrier to, uh, to contamination for the community of Christchurch. We have more than 300,000 people um, effectively now relying on a water supply with no barriers. And 
I always have considered the rigor with which Christchurch monitors the water and invests in its reticulation system to be a barrier in itself. The secure status of the, drink, of the groundwater is also another barrier. As far as I'm concerned as a professional, that is a multi-barrier approach. Some people will say you should always chlorinate. I think Christchurch is a special case. We don't need to always chlorinate. We have a special set of circumstances at the moment, which means in order to keep our community safe, as the City Council has always chosen to do in the past, we need to chlorinate the water. So I support uh, your Chief Engineer's recommendations, John Mackey's recommendations, that the water should be temporarily chlorinated until such time as the independent engineering company sign off secure status for our groundwater and then we can go back to enjoying the water that we've enjoyed for many decades. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, questions. Aaron? Um, yeah, thank you for that explanation from, uh, from both of you. It is very, very clear. The question that came to me through members of the public, and I do agree with them, is if the, there is a, if there's a potential risk to our water and our water supply because this chlorination process will take um, time to implement, it, it's not a switch that will be flipped on today, no doubt, uh, that why, if there is a danger or a risk, why is a boil water notice not issued straight away? A boil, noti boil water notice is not required. There is no imminent risk to the community. We have not had transgressions. Um, if we had transgressions, that would be different. Uh, we would definitely be issuing a boil water notice. But there is no imminent risk. This is about dealing with the long-term risk and making sure that the supply in the long term is a safe supply. So a boil water notice, in my view, is not necessary in the interim period. Uh, what is important is that the council gets on with the work expeditiously. But as our council knows well, disasters don't tend to stick to timelines. So if we got an outbreak, it could be today or tomorrow, or in three months' time once we've got the chlorination process mm -hmm. in, in place. So that's what I think some people are struggling with, including myself. Yeah. As I say, it's, it, we're dealing with an imminent risk. There, the probability is extremely low. The consequences may be high. But in the meantime, we have a system set up that has I've been identified by the engineer as a shortcoming in one area. It hasn't changed anything. That, that has been the same for a while. They have come back to us and said, these are issues you have to deal with. Um, in my view, there is not an imminent risk to the population. We have not seen for decades, uh, you know, our water has been safe. There's no change in that, but this is a process to keep our water safe uh, in, in, a, in a kind of medium to long term. It's not about, uh, it, it, once those wellheads are sealed in, uh, we, we'll be back to a safe situation. But chlorinating over a period of months is a way of dealing with that risk over a period of months. There's not a kind of day-to-day -day risk here that requires a boil water notice. Mm. Yanni? Yeah, I just wanted to check on the process. Um, you just want questions to the uh, medical officer of health, or are you? No, it's, it's staff. Okay, so number, let's put through questions as well. Are staff going to address those questions that we've put in like last night when we got the report? What's the process around that? We're in the process of addressing those. But the, uh, some of the questions are quite detailed and will take some time to answer. Right, so should I ask those questions now again, or? Well, yeah, you. okay, yeah, just, yep. Oh, okay. I, I've got you, Pauline, Phil, Sarah, Dion. Um, thank you. But they um, have to be relevant to the paper. It, it is yeah. relevant. Um, cool. So in regards to the, um, the issue of consultation with Tangata Whenua and the cultural perspective around putting chlorine into our water, what view or advice have we received in that regard? And do we have an obligation to um, engage with Māori over this decision? If, if, I, if, if I could, I, I had um, talked to Gabriel, our, our, our advisor, yesterday, and of course, similar to the medical officer of health, their first priority is for the health of their people. 
and so they fully support if we, if it's to the opinion of the, the health authorities that we have to chlorinate the water, uh, then then that it must be. Um, but they're obviously they're of the same view uh, to restore it to its previous condition. So that's the the early advice we have on that. Um, the second question was, I was just trying to understand. Obviously, nothing's changed in terms of. Um, from last year to this, well, the previous year and the year before that, in terms of the, the the boreheads, but they were signed off one year. They're not signed off the next year. So, just trying to understand with the earthquake, we must have had a program to assess the different um, wellheads. What did that show? And had any of the wellheads been picked up through the five-year audit or through the earthquake repairs? and we're on a program to get fixed, or were they still being signed off as OK? So after, after, the, after each of the four big earthquakes, all, all of the wellheads were assessed again, um, and the drilling contractors went round and then did the repairs over a period of time. That, that's all finished. Um, so the issues we're dealing with now aren't earthquake issues. What's changed is the, the standard that the engineers expect when they're doing the wellhead security assessments. So the standards changed because of had the Havelock findings, which haven't come into to law yet. No, no, no. I don't think that the standard has changed. Is that the right word, or oh, is it so is it that their right measure word. of assessment yep. of compliance changed, sure. and it's actually much more sensitive and rigorous, perhaps, mm -hmm. in relation to um, their obligations to sign off on secure status. Yep. Isn't it pretty clear from the report that I mean, if surface water can get in, then that's not acceptable. So, how can we have one year have that being identified as a possibility, and next year it's it's uh, and that year it's signed off, and next year it's still the same, but it's not signed off. Surely that's a kind of black and white measure if something's secure. So that, that that's about the risk aversion of the professional companies that have to rely. When, they, when you read the criticism of the, of the engineering company that, is, that assessed the Havelock Northwells, and none of them want to put that risk uh, onto their uh, professional indemnity insurance. But to turn so, Yanni's um, question around, it may well be that the quality of the assessment that was done in previous years was not of a high enough standard for the protection that we require for our water supply. Yeah, what was deemed acceptable in the no, previous... No, yeah. but it's not what was deemed acceptable to them. They may not have met a sufficient standard to provide real protection to our water supply in relation to the obligations under the drinking water standards. So I'm, I'm, I'm not letting the previous engineers off the hook uh, by a glib statement that the standard has changed just because um, uh, of the Havelock North inquiry. I don't, I don't think that's, that's so, you can make that assessment now. I think we do have to look at the quality of the work that was being undertaken before. Because remember, Havelock North, what the cause was, is exactly that. So the, the line in the report, in the 3.1 in the City Care Water Report, section 4.5.32, bore water security criterion two. Um, the borehead must be sealed at the surface to prevent the egress of surface water. So it's pretty black and white. It's not sort of, and I would have, what I can't understand is if we've had all the assessment post earthquake and all these independent engineers looking at these things, signing them off when we've got water egress, how has that been allowed to happen? That is the question of that all of these companies that are doing these um, regular, regulatory inspections are now aware of. And, and that's why we're seeing a, a lot more rigor in, in their assessments. And it's quite right. The, the standard to which they were um, applying to their assessments of the security of the wellheads may not have been, well, was not up to scratch, obviously. So is there a sort of independent inquiry? I mean, can we have a recommendation to actually go back and look? Well, I mean, there that, was that, an inquiry, so that was the Havelock North inquiry. And that's well, no, I'm talking about in our own situation. Yanni, can, we, can we deal with that um, separately? We're asking for uh, matters to go back to the Infrastructure, Transport and Environment um, a committee, and I would like them to consider the update uh, and the monthly progress report. And if they feel that it is appropriate to 
um, review that, which is something I favour myself, but it is something that I would rather deal with um, separately um, from this. And if you want to add uh, a, a, some wording to number four, then I'm quite happy that um, uh, review the, um, the, the process for reporting on it. But to have the draft water safety plan uh, now before the Infrastructure, Transport and Environment Committee for approval when completed adds the layer of governance which I think has been and I, missing. I do think it needs to come in front of the full council um, and also I, I had another question in regards to audit and risk and I know we've got a PX section on the agenda today. Would you prefer that I ask those questions in the public or in the PX section? We don't know the question. So, There's no item on the agenda for audit and risk today. No, no, we've got a PX section on our agenda around the legal advice in relation to this report. Do you, do you want questions around PX audit and risk reports previously that identified water quality now, or do you want that in the PX section? If it's a PX, yeah, no, I, if it's PX. Yeah, um, because I have no idea what you want to ask, it's really hard to give you guidance in that I, What regard. I really want to understand is given that we've got an Audit and Risk Committee, and given that this would have been one of the huge risks identified as in terms of um, a variety of mechanisms, you know, contract management, performance monitoring, uh, assessment of infrastructure, um, and drinking water quality, I just simply want to understand what process we have in place to make sure that you know the, the operational aspects of what council's doing here are aligned or uh, aligned with the audit and risk program, because when I read through that, there's a, there's a misalignment. Well, audit yeah. and risk will deal with that. Yeah. In audit and risk. Yeah. There, there will be a follow up with audit and risk, absolutely. But um, I'm I'm quite happy to work on some wording around around this and um, and. And given that we're, I just wonder whether that there will, um, that that should stop being a noting provision and just uh, um, ask staff to report to the infrastructure. And um, we'll find if some wording around uh, a review of the past inspection regime, and we will, um, and we'll have that report back to the council if that's all right, Pauline. Yep, cool. Um, so, uh, who was next? Pauline. Thank you. A question for John. Um, now, you mentioned that the um, <coughs> Director General of Health stated that we should not rely on secure well status. Can you expand on that in the light of um, if we were to, or when we uh, get our well ideas up to standard? What does that comment mean? Right, so that was one of the 51 recommendations from the inquiry um, back, to, back to government. Um, so that's an, an anticipation of what the Crown might do. We have no idea what the, what the government might do with that recommendation. Um, but in the meantime, he was asked to use the existing regulatory powers and bring those to the attention of drinking water suppliers. That was so all. So there could be some. There could be risk more to come. That if we, we do this work, which we want to do anyway, and it may still may not be enough. For us Depending to on what the Crown decides to do with the recommendations from the inquiry, yes. Okay, thank you very much. But I would also draw your attention to another item in our report, which um, is a, um, a a matter that we left on the. Um, a matter that we left on the uh, table, lying on the table, which was a recommendation from one of the committees saying that that um, we oppose the the, yes. the the permanent, you know, direction the direction for permanent chlorination. Um, and um, in actual fact, maybe we need to find some words that that incorporate our desire to um, see this as a mechanism by which we can. Uh, and, uh, yeah, but but ensure that that that, that remains the position uh, with central government as well. Um, Alistair, can I just make a comment on that statement from uh, the Director General? Christchurch has never relied just on on secure status. There's a lot of investment that the council and the, 
with the mandate from the community has put into an effective additional barrier, we go above and beyond all our monitoring requirements, backflow monitors, uh, maintenance of the reticulation system that, in effect, um, some may say is, is a better barrier than treatment because actually it prevents uh, 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 all sorts of different infections or um, contamination of your water, not just uh, bacterial and, and viral. So it, it's important to look at that in the right kind of context. And it's still important to remember that this is not about what the Director General says. This is not about the Havelock inquiry. This is about our routine processes. We have always been safe, and we have always, in effect, had a multi-barrier approach, even though we might not have used disinfection in our water. Yeah, but I think that the point that councillors are, you know, sort of grappling with at the moment is that clearly what has happened in terms of that secure status has been influenced by both of those factors. Yes. Um, right, I've got uh, Phil, Sarah, Dion, and. So my, my question really is in relation to the complexity of all of this too, and, and like we have a recommendation uh, in relation to informing the community um, around these decisions and that we would do that in, in, connection, in conjunction with the Medical Officer of Health um, and informing the, the, the community. But I'm just wondering, g given how complex this is, should we as a council not also be considering how in fact we go wider around the drinking water as one part of Christchurch's uh, water issues? And is there perhaps potential that the government, central government might also work with us? So that in fact people understand what actually is happening, especially in connection to wa uh, drinking water safety. So what, what I would like to see is that, is that in fact, maybe as a council we should go wider than just talking about informing, uh, people, but in fact we should have a, a edu whole education program so that there's better understanding. Yeah, uh, I, I have been following social media and some of the comments have been quite interesting and, and would indicate a, a lack of knowledge about some things, um, in, including the fact that there is no treatment applied to water that's um, bottled. Um, because of course there is, but it's UV treatment. And, but, but we're not talking about a permanent solution here, we're talking about a temporary solution. And I think in the longer term, if we're looking at um, getting back to, well, in, in, in the short term, getting back to, or the medium term, getting back to secure um, status, then we will be relying on the multi-barrier approach that we've always had as a city. So. But I think it would be useful, and I, I'm, I agree with you, I think that we need a very wide media campaign and listening to the, um, the, the public participation that we had just before, we cannot just rely on social media. So we're gonna have to, I think, uh, buy some advertising with very clear messages. Um, but the, 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 the challenge for everyone is that the risk is no greater than it was. The risk has not changed. The risk is slight. The risk is small. <coughs> but the consequences of anything going wrong are huge. And that's the difference. And that's what risk is. It's, it's, it's probability and consequences. When you've got low probability and high consequences, you tend to think around the probability, shall we take the risk? We did that when we considered the shallow bores in the northwest. Are we prepared to take that risk for the whole city? That's the question. And just in, to further than that, in anticipation of the release of the stage two report, we did work with our communications people and started preparing a communications plan ahead of the report landing. And in that, there is a, a whole range of uh, community um, education, advice, uh, even a, an advertising schedule f for whatever the outcome might have been. So th there is that work that's already been done. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Alistair. Your approach has been incredibly helpful um, and clear throughout this. I'm just wondering if... Um, You've been really complimentary about the processes that we have as an extra barrier, so the, the actual management of the system itself. And I'm wondering if um, our 
mitigation might have an option that isn't coronation that would satisfy you through management. So it's very clear that the the likelihood, slim as it is, comes when there's rain events um, and there's potential surface water um, egress into the, the wellheads. If we were able to have a management system which had uh, contractors or staff on site during rain events checking for water, if there was any sign of water entering any of the wellheads, that that particular wellhead was switched off until it could be cleaned, would that satisfy you as to the safety of our water supply without having to go through the full uh, preemptive chlorination of our entire city supply? Um, the question it really is seems to me to be rather a technical one, yeah. but um, the first point I'd make is that there are 103 wells yeah. dotted through the city. Uh, so it's quite a lot of wells we're talking about. Secondly, it's very important to understand that although flooding is, has been presented as an example of how egress of surface water or other contaminants might get in, we cannot predict every eventuality. That's the point. Um, if, if we could, we would deal with it on a kind of, you know, we could, we could see exactly what was going to happen. The point about the drinking water standards is they're set up to protect from all eventualities. If you like, it's an all-hazards approach. So I don't think it would be reliable to say, okay, we think maybe flooding is a risk. Indeed, it could be. What, what about other risks? What about leakages from sewage pipes that are n unpredictable? Um, so mm -hmm. I, I don't think we're in a situation where we can just kind of guess what the hazard is going to be and try and respond to that. We have to have something that is going to fix the water, keep it safe for the period of time until we know that um, the, the, the system is sealed properly. Now, I think uh, some people have raised the issue of, well, maybe UV treatment is, is an option, but actually from a financial perspective, that is so expensive that um, that would be an inappropriate cost for a short, for what is in effect a short period of time. Yeah. So chlorination is technically, in my view, is the only um, technical approach. But John Mackey may have comments on whether there are alternatives. But as far as I can see, it's the only one we've yeah. got. Yeah. And yes, Alice is quite right. And of course, with flood events, to have people standing at boreheads when most people are deployed looking at flooding homes and flooding streets, uh, the, the type of resource we're talking about there is um, is, is huge. Um, UV not not practicable for a temporary solution. High investment, high capital. It needs building, it needs land, it needs uh, mechanical equipment. Um, so not able to be deployed quickly either. So that would take a longer time, mm. and and a much higher cost. Thank you, and um, that's good to hear because I think that um, I mean some of our communications have said that we're looking at all options, mm. and um, and non-chemical ones haven't been presented um, in this case. Um, there's been some commentary um, in social media and in, in, in the general media about the, the delays. And I'm just wondering if, um, since we lost our secure status on the 22nd, um, whether it would have been, whether you all still would have preferred us to have been chlorinating prior to now. So but while we had the, the council break, um, staff have the delegation, should they choose to use it, to actually proactively chlorinate our, our city supply. Um, and while there hasn't been an imminent risk, you're asking us to do it now, yeah. would you have preferred us to do it earlier as an organisation? The work was already started between senior staff from Health and City, City Council as soon as they got the information on the 22nd. Um, I suppose in the best of all possible worlds what we're saying is things should happen as promptly as possible. Um, I think uh, it would still have required the Council to come to a decision anyway. Um, but um, I sub my answer is yes, as soon as possible. Um, but if the question then is, has there been an unnecessarily large risk presented to our community because of that delay? The answer is no, because 
nothing has changed, as we've said, it's the rigour of the application of the, the standards by the engineering company that's changed, and um, therefore the message is let's get on with this, let's get it done as soon as possible so that we can lift chlorination as soon as possible. So one of the concerns I have is um, with our engagement with the community. Um, so there's been uh, a decision taken that this should be a council decision rather than a staff one. Um, and that presumably is for, um, for elected members, representatives of the community to be able to take other things into account than maybe the technical detail that staff would use. Um, and I'm just wondering, given that you don't have any great concerns about the delay so far, whether you would be concerned about a further delay should we um, choose to consult with the community over this. Um, it seems that we have local government, once it gets to a council space, we have obligations under the Local Government Act in, uh, with issues of high significance, which this is clearly, um, to consult with our communities. And being that there is no great urgency and there is no imminent risk, whether we should be consulting with the community over this. Um, whether you consult with the community or not, you have a, an obligation to deliver a safe water supply. You now know that um, the, the engineers have told you that it is not completely safe. Um, you can't unknow that. Um, you have to, in my view, react promptly um, and uh, therefore, I think it's, it's good that the council are considering this. It's good that they're taking a decision, but I think they need to take a decision promptly with the best technical information that they have received from, uh, from health and from their engineers. I don't think it is appropriate. Uh, this, this is not, in my view, because the conditions arise under the Health Act, it is not, in my view, a, uh, an issue um, that should have delay built into it by a consultation process. I strongly agree that the public need to be clearly informed about your reasons for this. And my view, certainly over the last few days, is that we have a community who understand these things. Um, there are some misunderstandings, as the Mayor has said, but by and large, the questions I've received from the community, and I have received a few, have been sensible questions um, People in Christchurch understand, I think most, most people understand the risks, and they also understand uh, the, the processes that are being put in place to keep their water safe in the past, and so they should, because it's their money that's going into it. So I, I don't think it requires a consultation. I think it requires information, and I think it requires a prompt response. Uh, thanks. Um, was this the first year we've used this engineering company? No. Oh, no. For it's, a, it's, a, it's the first time we've used this company for wellhead security assessments. And why did we change? Uh, because we've now got a, a panel of consultants that we use for Three Waters work, and uh, the previous consultant isn't on that panel, and so there was a panel member who had suitable experts, so we chose to use um, procure it through the panel. Um, no, that, that's, that's cool. Um, the question I have around the, the wellheads is, how, is there any idea of how many <laughs> wellheads we have that are at risk under the current um, circumstances that we're facing? Yeah, well that, that's covered in the report. There are 103, uh, all at varying degrees of, of, um, you know, of, of, of repairs required. Uh, and they've been triaged, so we're working on the, the most severe first, but the total, of, total is 103. So the, 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 as we get through the, the, the programme of work, um, the, the actual pace of those repairs should pick up because there isn't so much work involved. Yeah, so what, I, what I'm thinking is, 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 do you think there would be a time where we go through the most critical ones to start with and then we can go back to the, the drinking water assessor and say, we have done this amount, we've done those critical ones, do you think, and then go back to the engineers and say, this is the work program we've done on these critical ones. Do you think we've got enough of those critical ones done to actually then be able to sign off on the drinking water standards as secure? Uh, then we can go back to the drinking water assessor and say this, the engineers are signed off on those certain ones that were at most at risk 
and then we can get back, you know, satisfy those conditions yes. to unchlorinate if we do that. Yes, and that's an option we are looking at. So we will progressively uh, get that, that statutory assessment done as we complete the program rather than waiting till the end. And if it is able to be done on a zone by zone basis, we'll, we'll certainly endeavour to do that. So, uh, and, 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 but that will really depend on that uh, agreement and alignment with the, the drinking water assessor who has to sign off on the, on the water safety plan. But the engineers have to sign off on the, on the secure status. Get, and so yeah. obviously there may be some that are worse off than others, and we've seen that graph in the report. But do you, do you have any indication of where we may get to in that point where the engineers may be able to say, OK, we're happy and satisfied that the worst ones are done, the ones that are still yet to be done under the work programme are OK um, under the current you know, as drinking water standards, and that they will be happy to sign off the entire well, the, the work program that's been done in the entire city, so that we can go back and get, you know, unchlorinate the water if we're going yeah, down I, that track. I, I'd be speculating, and I don't want to speak for the drinking water assessor, who would have to make that call. And uh, we've said December this year, uh, but we will be using best efforts to bring that forward by utilising multiple crews where we don't need the specialist lining contractor. We can get another other crews to come go and do the other minor repairs and then progressively get the, the sign-off by the independent engineers and, and hopefully get to a point of agreement uh, with the drinking water assessor where there is satisfaction that there are sufficient controls in place, sufficient security on the, above the uh, below-ground wellheads in order to um, give us back that status and we could then cease chlorination. But I can't speak for the drinking water assessor at this point. OK, and, and the other question that's related around this was this, a lot of them, or a number of the bo a number of the wellheads are, are leaning on towards what uh, Councillor Templeton was saying was around flooding. Now, if we could address those ones, and and then with the other ones that have got lower risk, could we then get to a point in the city where we could turn off full time chlorination, but then part time? Well, if there was a flooding event, that would maybe sort of looking at some of the other wellheads actually just turn it on in those times until we got to the end of the it's, program. It's not just flooding that could cause contamination, it could be just high groundwater levels, which you wouldn't even see. So you could have high, high groundwater get causing those ones contamination. Done first. So it's, it's not something you can easily predict. I think I made the point that there's, a, there's an array of predictable problems which we are aware of. There's also the unpredictable problems. Um, it's an all hazards approach, not let's pick, try and pick off those that we think are, are going to cause us problems. Um, the other one that there's, there was um, th a lot of questions uh, that I've been getting from people are around, and, and there's two there's two parts to this one is is the safety of chlorination in itself from a health perspective and from an infrastructure perspective. Is, you know, is there anything that we can say to actually allay those fears to people or is there actually some real risk that, that is posed if we do go down chlorination? There is no health risk from chlorination, um, quite the opposite. Um, the whole point of chlorination is to reduce health risk. Chlorination has been used for more than 100 years worldwide. Chlorination takes place in most cities in New Zealand as we speak and has done for quite some time. Christchurch is an unusual exception. Um, there, are, there is a theoretical risk, which some people might be aware of, of what they call disinfection byproducts, um, where chlorine has been shown in some very old papers to have reacted with the biomass in pipes. Um, and those byproducts can have a, have a health effect. However, those papers are old, and the more recent papers have suggested that it is not chlorine, in fact, that is the risk there, but it's bromine part byproducts, which we obviously are not putting into the system. In any case, um, disinfection byproducts are one of the many substances that are monitored as part of the drinking water standards, and therefore um, they are kept at a very, very safe level anyway, and we are alerted to them if they were to go up. Moreover, uh, John Mackey has proposed air scouring of the pipes in order that the biomass is reduced. Another way of 
absolutely minimizing those disinfection byproducts. So the answer is no, there is not a health risk from chlorine. And I suppose given that people are reading the newspapers today and have heard that chlorine has been used in Syria, they might have difficulty understanding the difference between using chlorine as a chemical weapon, using chlorine for the benefit of people. Um, obviously, chlorine, as it is used in drinking water, is kept to a very, very low level that just removes microbial contamination. And the skill of the, of the engineers is ensuring that they put in as little as they need to, to just ensure that there's enough chlorine in there to do the job that it's required to do. And it doesn't have, at those levels, it comes nowhere near causing any health effects. I've got one more, if that's, if that's OK. And it was just on the finance, um, more, changing tune a little bit more on the finances in, in point, uh, 6.7. Um, and it says additional, and this is to John, additional budget may be required for further improvements to the wellhead recommendation, uh, sorry, the wellheads recommended in the latest wellhead security assessments. Um, can you just explain a little bit more just what that means and how much potentially more we might be liable for if we go down this program to get up to the drinking water standards as, as mentioned in there? Yes, so that's the gap I think we talked about before between what the independent engineers assessed needed to be done as against the $840,000 in the program that CityCare had suggested. So we haven't got the final figures what that gap is, so there's still some discussion to be had with the drinking water assessor, um, the, the assessment engineers and our contractors as to what we agree would, as the extra would need to be done over and above the eight hundred and forty. I don't expect, I don't anticipate that's going to be significant, but it's, we haven't got the number just yet, but we've so, certainly been and, and so where will that budget specifically come well, from? Well, we've been more? challenged, we've been tasked to, um, to find this within existing maintenance, maintenance budget, so it may mean that other things of lesser importance will, would be deferred. Okay. I mean... And that comes back to my initial point, was where do we get to to the point where we may actually end up saying, we're actually, we've got enough of this done so we can actually turn the chlorination off, but obviously that'll come later. We've got this, you know, all the way through the, the recommend date of sorry. All the way through the recommendations, all the way through the recommendations, we're making it crystal clear that this is for a temporary period that we want staff to be working hand in glove with the drinking water assessor to see if we can switch any of it back on without the chlorine, if we can, um, and so, so we're going through zone by zone. That's very challenging because as you can see from the maps, the nature of the zones are, you know, there's one large zone and some very small zones um, and it's, it may not be so straightforward, but we've challenged staff to do that um, at the same time that we've challenged them to find the budget from within their existing um, provisions. And, and, and is it appropriate for it to go to ITI, or is it, is it of significance to come straight to council? No, no, no. It'll go through ITI, but it'll come through. It'll come back to council with a recommendation. I'm just thinking because of the ex the the, the, the uh, importance of this and the and the time frame that we're talking about. There's a there is always a delay between it going to a committee and then straight. We to can council. always bring it forward. There are three council meetings a it's month. Fine. Yeah. Um. So and David Tim. Thank you, and thank you, Alistair, for your very clear and reassuring summary of the situation. A question for you. It's my understanding that you uh, you make the decision to lift um, the chlorination um, order, I guess it is. What do you need to, to be satisfied 
to do that? What what is what is um, what do you need to know, and how will you know that it's time to lift the chlorination order? Uh, secure bore status is what we will look for. That has to come from the engineering, an independent engineering assessment. And a second question for John and the staff. Um, I think a, a lot of people are worried that this is, we're heading down a slippery slope of permanent chlorination. And um, can you give us reassurances that that is not, in fact, going to happen? And how, how will we know that that's not going to happen? Um, that's not an assurance I can give, unfortunately, uh, because the other thing that's in play here is what the government does with the 51 recommendations from the inquiry. The inquiry recommends to government that we mandate uh, adequate treatment across all of New Zealand. Uh, and that we, and we could, while we might be able to engage in that debate by saying uh, we could be a special case or a special exemption, um, that would be the path I think I'm hearing is, is the way that Christchurch might want to go. Um, but will, we're powerless. Will want to yeah, go. Yeah, will, to go. yes. Yeah, so, um, but we don't know what those, what the government's response to those recommendations will be yet. So that's uh, that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question, I suppose. Will they have to legislate? They'd have to change the drinking water yes, standards. So, that's so it's, they wouldn't require legislation. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Sorry? It, might, it might come under regulations rather than a change in statute, right. but I don't know. You know. It depends on. I think it would be most unfortunate if the government didn't allow for public engagement in that conversation. Mm. But I've heard them talking about transparency, so maybe that would be um, included. Right, David, Tim and Aaron. Uh, thank you. Um, we've, we've had indicated that we've got 103 wells that need to be um, remedied and, and obviously it's our objective to do that as quickly as possible. The seven that have been um, remedied to date, uh, what was the process to select those seven and, and do they reflect uh, wellheads that were at greater risk or, um, or where are we going and, and going forward with the repair program, are you identifying wellheads that pose a, uh, a potential uh, greater threat to do those first? Yes, there, there, there was a, a, an assessment done on the, on the criticality of the wellheads that were selected first, the, the ones in the main pumps which is in, in Beckenham, uh, they were subject to some of that severe flooding we had in July, so quite severe flooding of contaminated stormwater, um, that posed a great risk. Uh, and of course, the, the, the and the schedule was prepared in consultation with uh, our, our own technical people and the drinking water assessor and the contractor. Um, so they're done in the order of the most important. So, so of the, the remaining 96 that we have to um, to deal with, are there any that um, fall into the same level of um, severity that we have already dealt with, or have we dealt with the? absolute worst already or how many more at that high end of uh, exposure to risk would we have to deal with? Yeah, that, that's difficult to know in the detail. We've just named them in here. Um, they, what they might entail would have to, would, I could come back to the ITI and say, well, this is the amount of work. And there is a, I think in the, one of the reports from City Care, there is a, um, a, a costing against each of the wellheads and you could take by inference that the greater the cost, the more work that needs to be done. So that's on page uh, 29 of the, of the report. So are we, are we working through them in that order? In the priority order. order. order of priority. Yep, yeah, correct. Thank you. Yep. Um, ugh, sorry, I'm just sidetracked. Um, Tim, Aaron, Sarah. Thank you. Um, John. First question to you, I've only got two questions, so I won't take up too much time. First question is, we're in late January now, it's going to take 60 days to implement the um, chlorine if we go that way. Um, so we're looking at if we expedite the programme, somewhere hopefully in October, but it may be December, but it could be longer. But So we're looking around seven to nine months, hopefully, that we would have to chlorinate, taking in the 60 days to set up, etc. With regards to that, could, and I know Alistair you mentioned that we, we can't really 
rely on it being a flood event that would be the contamination. It could be a blown sewer or something along those lines. But if we were to set up the chlorination, would it be possible to set that up to imp implement it? Because I'm not an engineer, I don't know how you do that, to um, implement in the event of something coming towards us, as in if we got a few days or a week of a storm event coming, could we do that rather than to implement it straight away within the si uh, following the 60 days? I'm just trying to see, are we able to cut down the time that we, the, we chlorinate if we go that way? Um, th th it, would be, it would make a lot of sense um, to, to try and roll this out within, within, within the two months we talked about. I've, in discussions uh, with City Care um, at their response after the earthquakes, it was six to eight weeks um, to deploy the, the chlorination. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I expect that would be the, the, the best way. And we'd start it all at once. It would by far and away be the mm -hmm. best um, way of deploying the chlorine, and which gives, during that 60 days, you could do quite a bit of mains cleaning as well to reduce the impact. So, um, so rather than staggering it, um, I would suggest that we do a, a mains cleaning mm -hmm. program in parallel with the establishment of of these 56 different um, locations that require skid mounted chlorination equipment um, located at each one of those sites. So, so with the chlorine, do you set it all up and then then it, it starts to, to mix in, or or do could my, I guess my question is, could you set it up to be able to implement immediately if there were an event happening yeah. or, or, or or an event? The, the trouble is, we don't know when that event might be. Um, so groundwater intrusion, for, ex for example, there'd be no weather event associated with that, perhaps. So, um, and I don't know that that would meet uh, the requirements that, um, of, of, the of the advice that we have. But with securing the boreheads, would that save from a contamination from a sewer leak? Yes. It would? Okay. Through, through that mechanism. Okay, yes. okay thanks. Uh, the second question is, um, with, and I, don't, I wouldn't want to um, weigh council staff down on a report or a review of where, where, where we've been and how we've got here until the concentration should be on expediating what we're doing and looking at that later on. But I, I think that following all this, to have a review or a post-event report on how we've got and what's happened would be really important to, got, but to the council, full council, because I'm yeah, not... Yeah, I've, I've got a recommendation that through the ITI committee, so it comes back to council through ITI, that they look at a review of the inspection regime for the monitoring assessment of below ground wellheads undertaken prior to June 2017 and since, because I think what we need to understand as councillors, and that's why I don't, I don't just buy that it's the standards have changed, mm. Yep. What, were the previous standards good enough, and was and was the not not the results of the inquiry, yep. but the events of August 2016, were they sufficient to be the wake-up call that actually the country needed? I, I totally understand that. I totally respect that going the, the chair of the um, ITI committee coming back and reporting to full council. Yep. But this is of such significance to the city. I'm not a member of the ITI committee. I'm not a member of the You can go to it though. So, oh yeah, I can. Yeah, but I can. think that it should, that the review should come to full council. It will. But via ITI, it should come. Why, why get council staff to do two things when they can just come back to full council? Because they can come back through ITI. I mean, ITI might pick up some of the some of the issues that they want further clarification on um, before it comes back to council. I mean, it is important to have the specialist committee that actually has the, 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 the detailed knowledge and has the ongoing um, oversight responsibilities for this program of work. So, I mean, it, it's, it's not unusual for it to go through a committee first, but the full yes. report will come to council. I totally realise that and understand that, but yeah. I think this is such significance that it should, but you know, that's a difference of yeah. opinion. But, but please do go, and, and every councillor can go to um, individual committee meetings, and I would encourage that perhaps when you get to that one, um, Pauline, it might be worthwhile holding it as a separate meeting and um, uh, as, as a specific item of the agenda, the issues that are being considered here. So I guess and, 
in that case, will non-members of the ITI committee get a chance to speak and be part of that discussion? Because I think we do that by invite of the chair, and I totally respect that as well. But again, I'm saying that this is such a significant issue. Yeah, no. That, uh, so, but that's a that's a that's a question only the chair. That, that, that's, that's down to each chair. But but generally speaking, people have the right to speak, but not to vote. That's the only difference. Generally speaking. Yeah. It's such a significant issue, I think, that there oh, look, should be I understand this completely. It the conference is about to end. Oh, <laughs> oh Jamie. 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 Well, no, well, Jamie, the I'm conference is about to well. end. Well, uh, you can dial back, back in. I need to dial back in. All right, I will dial back in. I must, mustn't have paid my telecom bill. No. Uh, Jamie. I'll, yes, you, I'll ring straight back. You, you dial back in. Thank you. Yeah, I'll go straight back in. Okay. I don't know. Have you emailed the resolutions to um, Jamie? You could look on the screen. Surely he could look on the screen. Yeah. Um, I think we're still working on another recommendation to go. It's up there. It's up oh, it's in there seven. now. Right, okay. Um, so, we've got... Um, I, I, I just think we should continue and get this done rather than um, break for morning tea. Yeah. Do we have a legal requirement to break for a particular... after? I'm back, by the way. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, um, Aaron, I'll, I'll go to you. Yeah, I just have a couple of follow-ons, but we, we, I may have to depart the room because I've been consuming lots of water because it's not chlorinated yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to preload just in case, depending on how the decision goes. And, and uh, my body's n never seen so much water. It's normally a different colour. Now, um, my two questions uh, that have, j have arisen through the um, question process is you mentioned Beckenham before, which posed one of the greatest risks. This one's been, especially around that flooding, when that flooding event happened, the last one, um, not just the one. But uh, And was that then tested? And were there any transgressions when we had the flooding event at that wellhead, given it was one of the worst? That, yeah, there have been no transgressions at all. Right. From, from those wells. And that was just confirming one of the worst. Correct. And had flooding all around it. Yeah. Cool. That's a good start. And then the other one is, what assurances can we give the public that once the schedule of works, the accelerated schedule of works, is completed and these are um, uh, been finished to the standard that you're expecting, um, what insurances can we give the public that the engineers and then the water assessor will sign off and say they are secure, we are happy, there will be no chlorine. So the engineers have confirmed in writing that once we've implemented their recommendations they will sign off the wells as secure. Well, that, that's good. And then the other one is the water assessor himself. Have, so do we have a word as long as the happy? groundwater is secure, they, they are then... Um, the the supply would be co compliant with the drinking water standards, so that would be signed off as well, immediately. Sarah, then Mike. Thank you. I'm just wondering if, um, Jenny, we've had concerns over um, the previous monitoring, but there have been many um, comments uh, by members of the public who want reassurance that the the governance response has been appropriate, and I'm just wondering if part of the reporting that comes back should include that as well, um, with the delays and all sorts of things. There's been quite a lot of questions around that. Um, whenever we've had major things happen, you know, the fire response, those kind of things, we've had some form of reporting, and I know that's been through the Civil Defence Act, but um, whether that should uh, happen as well, to reassure people that the response has been appropriate. Which... Um which recommendation is that? Can you go back up to four? So that report at the moment um, talks about the ass 
assessments, but not the other sort of the other governance processes and reporting and and all of those kind of structures that um, may have allowed earlier action. For example. Yeah. No, no, because that deals with the technical, not the process. <coughs> so it look, looks at the review of the inspection regime, the monitoring and assessment, but not that reporting structure for those types of things to council. And I mean, just to say, that's similar to the question I had around the audit and risk. Yeah. So finance and performance audit and risk capacity. Yeah. And how do we get the best governance? But in this instance, we've covered that by strengthening the reporting through to ITI, and I think ITI no, no, will be on top a report of that. so that we can learn from Welcome what has happened potentially um, in the way of reporting. So there were things that ITI didn't know, for example, through this process, um, and there are there, there have been questions about the delay in our response and having a a review just to look at that Sorry, response. Uh, I, there's an assumption that there's been a delay in the response well, that, from the council. This is the right. first council meeting of the year. So there hasn't been a delay in our response. You know, um, and so I, I just I just think that um, what the last thing that I want to do is to take people's minds off the fact that we need to get this work done so that we can, um, if we implement temporary chlorination, that we can get it out of our water as quickly as possible. That's, That's right. my priority. So, and if we're um, able to reassure people that there hasn't been a delay, then that would be really good. Um, but there have been questions and it would be quite This is the first like council that. meeting of the year. There is no delay. This is the first opportunity this council has had to react to it. The council staff have had delegation in this matter. They relinquished that this week. So this is the first time this council could deal with the matter. So I, I, I just kind of want to put that to bed. There is no delay that has caused any risk to our communities that is any greater than any risk that they've ever faced in relation to our water. So I just think that um, it, it's a side issue, but it is an issue that that um, that obviously uh, council council laws will want to raise at some stage uh, in the reasonably near future, but not through a reporting mechanism to a committee. So, um, and that is something that we can address uh, on a on a different occasion. So uh, I've got Mike next. Thank you. Um, my questions were actually around what Tim was talking about, about the 60 days to implement the chlorination. <coughs> After the earthquakes, how long did it take to actually, once that decision was made to chlorinate, how long did it take? Um, about eight weeks, six to eight weeks. Okay. So, so you are sort of saying before that you're going to wait till everything's set up and then do all the chlorination at once. Is that sort of indicating really the risk isn't that high, that you're not putting it in line as soon as you possibly that, that is yeah. as soon as possible. We have to purchase yeah. the equipment yeah. uh, and install it before we can start coronating. From what I took from your last um, well, answer was you're actually going to set everything up. Though. Instead of doing them, as soon as you get one online and start dosing it straight away, you'll wait till everything's ready to go and then dose it all at one. On one. I think that's the best advice because if we start to, to timing that over different parts of the city, that chlorine, because of the integrated way of network arrangement, uh, we want to tell people a given date, this is the date, so they can plan for things. There are people who are going to have to uh, make other provisions, people on dialysis, people with tropical fish, people who, who rely on unchlorinated water for their, uh, might be food manufacturing. So um, we've got to be clear that we've got to give them a concise date, otherwise they could be leaching from one zone to another. So when someone gets chlorine when they didn't think they were going to, we don't want to have that situation. So chlorinating the water is going to put another risk for some people? It will. It, the, it's about information. It's about informing people. I mean, people on dialysis use chlorinated water all over, all over the country. Country. They just need to be de dechlorinated for that purpose. Same with tropical fish. They so we, we know at the, at the moment that the risk hasn't changed. We're just obviously aware there's an issue, but there's no change to the risk. So technically, what we could say is this is where the water's at. It's been the same as it always has been. 
if you're concerned, boil your water. And let people choose what they want to do to actually make their water sterile. Yeah. Can I make yeah. a comment about it's boil water changed. nurses? It's a secure status. Yeah. yeah. Um, that, that is not an appropriate and responsible position for a supplier to take to rely on a boil water notice. The, a boil water notice is an emergency provision that has a limited value. Um, it was remarkable that after the earthquake, the people of Christchurch continued to boil their water for up to, well, it, was, it was up to the point at which the water became chlorinated. And we knew that because we carried out telephone surveys. The reason it was remarkable is because all the evidence suggests from all over the world that boil water notices have little value after the first few days. People boil their water rigorously at first, then one day they don't do it, nothing happens, they feel they're okay, they then don't boil their water. Then the problem happens. So boil water notices are not the solution for long-term risk. And so another question, so although our, our water's in zones, those zones aren't isolated, they can, the network's integrated, isn't it? It all joins yeah, up. Yeah, they can together. be operated in, you know, in different configurations. So if, if we did have an outbreak in one zone, could that be controlled to that one zone or would it filter through to the whole of the network? Normally, if there is any transgression, and as Alistair said, it's generally at, at reservoirs, we do chlorinate in that given zone and we try and isolate as much as we can. Um, to, to, to stop the spread of any contamination beyond um, the immediate vicinity. And that's the same within the, the actual city? Yes, so. correct. I'm just asking staff to put the zone picture up there because I think people need to see the size of the zones that we're talking about when we um, quite rightly are trying to look to isolate zone by zone but when you look at the central pressure zone, then it is uh, most of Christchurch. Um, I don't think that's quite right, uh, okay. there was the ability to isolate patches of that. It's just that that whole zone now is connected. There is still a possibility. Yeah, of, and we've of, asked staff yeah, to do yeah, that on a, on a, on a case by case zone. basis where it can be done. But You've also said that there's a potential around leaching as well between yes, the zones. Yes, of water between, between zones. So, um, there was someone else, Glenn. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just one question on the uh, regulatory time frame. Have you got any sense of, um, t in terms of uh, government, uh, uh, you know, coming out of stage two when any regulation perhaps maybe new government early days so are you thinking maybe later in this calendar year or? yeah well, well certainly my, my, my advice from uh, from the inquiry is that they have, they have prepared the report that's gone to the, the the DG it's gone to the Department of Internal Affairs as well and, and to the ministers who call for it um, and there there, there, there is um, staff advice or advisor advice being prepared uh, for, for government to consider. And I believe all that advice will be in with government by June this year. So what happens after that, uh, there'll be another process, there'll be the consideration around what the response is. Right. I have no sense of how long things take through uh, through the House, yeah. but um, you know, how soon after that is Could it a guess? A, a regulatory matter yeah. would not go through Parliament. That's okay. my that's my concern. That's why I asked the question about whether it was statutory or regulatory. Okay. It's a it's a question for the um, executive. Perhaps I can just add one thing. The drinking water standards is a provision in the Health Act that says um, if they're going to amend the drinking water standards, there needs to be consultation for at least three years, unless um, it causes an amendment, unless um, they think it needs to be done. Uh, it's a matter of urgency or it deals with a transitional or minor nature. Right. So just to check. Because I, I don't know about central government. So the, the Cabinet would make the decision. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Mm. So, um, any more? Uh, Yanni? Um, 
I, I just wanted to check on on the repair program. I note that in the city care report, it says that um, the repair program would not address the sewage getting into the water system as the flooding in July last year. So, in terms of the repair program, I just wanted to understand: Are we looking? Um, I know we want to get this done as soon as possible. I, I understand that, but for areas that are susceptible to flooding, in terms of raising the, the station out of ground, like the Burnside Park one, are we looking at, or do we get a choice around the level of investment to secure the, the ones that you know we may consider that it's more beneficial long term? Who makes that call? The recommendation is to repair the below ground wellheads. The, 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 the program to bring them all above ground, we're better off to wait to end of useful life. Because once, once they're repaired to a waterproof standard, um, one, one could argue that they are as good as an above ground wellhead as far as ingress of surface water is concerned. And we're mm -hmm. talking about some fairly high tech sealants here um, that, uh, that are quite effective. Um, we can, you know, we can decide through the LTP process that um, the city wants to bring all of the, the wells, below ground wells, above ground. And that would be a consideration that the council would make at the, the LTP capital program review. So um, it, it is all possible, but these wells, below ground wells, they have an, an average life of 50 to 60 years. And you would be walking away from that investment if you did it early. So there's an economic argument here as well. Let's make the best use of the assets that we have keep them in a good, tight, operative condition, uh, reduce the risk of ingress of surface water, and I think we, we then when we replace those wells at the end of their useful life, we then replace that with an, an above ground structure. But, with sorry, just, just, just a quote from the City Care Report. Um, uh, the residual risks which will remain following completion of the repair works include chamber inundation through higher than designed rainfall events, river waterway flooding. So. What I can't understand is given that, and we also told that in the July event that we got the river water inundated a number of wellheads contaminated them with sewage wastewater, which had been washed in by surcharged sewage networks pump stations. So why wouldn't we raise those ones at least above ground? Uh, I, I, there's two, two things here. There, there's raising the, the chambers rather than the actual wellhead. But raising right. the wellhead above ground means a new, a new board, uh, which is a different matter altogether. So it's just about putting like extra risers on the chamber so that it's above a given flood level. And we're doing that citywide flood modelling to determine what those flood levels are. So the ones that got raw sewage in them in July last year, the repair program that we're being asked to approve is going to stop sewage getting into them? Absolutely going to reduce the risk of that contamination occurring, absolutely. What do we need to actually stop it from happening? Oh, it, it, it's all about investment. So, but the city care report says that if we go with the repair that they are proposing, it won't stop that from happening. In, in extreme events. Well, uh, we, we've, we've heard over and over that the flooding along the Heathcote River, for example, is no longer considered extreme, that it happens on a regular basis. So, I mean, I just, I just worry that there may be cases where we actually want additional investment, and I know it will cost more, but to actually um, address that what does seem a very real risk that we've actually, yeah. I know so it may not be recorded as a transgression, but I would have thought from a health point of view, it's a pretty significant risk that is very real to people. Yeah, but so these things can be, can, be water, can be waterproof entirely. And that's something we can come back at with the normal, regular monthly YouTube reports to give you progress on those and give you that assurance um, that that method of contamination um, won't occur on these improved okay. wellheads. Can, can I just ask the medical officer of health? In, in those July flood events, there was no boil water notice issued. No, there were no transgressions either. And and so even though the the, the sewage got into the the water supply, it it was no 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 no, no water sewage did not get into the water supply. Sorry, the, um, I'll just I'll, I'll quote the thing so it's totally accurate. During the rainfall event of 20 to 22nd July, river water inundated a number of wellheads, contaminating them with sewage wastewater, 
which had been washed in via surcharge sewage network pump station. So it didn't go into the water supply. I, yeah. So, so the issue was that it got into the wellhead, but it didn't get into the water system. And the mitigation for that, anything, should anything get in there, that now has sump pumps that pump it straight out again, and secondly, it has an alarm that goes to a SCADA uh, system, and there's people on standby who get that alarm immediately with a 60 minute response time. So those mitigations are there what provides the confidence that that is not a risk. So we, but we would know, would we know within 24 hours whether it had been contaminated? We'd know within, within an hour. Right. Uh, because the sump pump's gonna do its job, and the wet floor alarm is going to trigger. And so while the sump pumps start off, the, the, the person on call has got the alarm and, and order them so, then to go out and right. deploy. So just understanding in terms of a risk point of view, if we know within an hour, what's to stop us from then going and chlorinating given that we know something's happened? Versus what we're being told now is that we should just chlorinate yeah, across the network. one mechanism though, uh, Councillor. There's other mechanisms that we might not be as obvious as a July storm event. possible to have a two minute break before debate, please? Because I don't want to miss any of the debate and I need to leave the room. Sorry, I didn't turn my microphone on. Uh, Jamie, have you got any questions? I'd just like to come to you now. Thanks. Um, I think a lot of it's been out and I actually heard Tali Niviani's questioning and it may have been along the same line. Tim started it, but um, so apologies if this has been covered, but it's really just around the rollout versus deployment. So I just want to be clear on that. Is it 60 days to build and put in place the temp temporary infrastructure to chlorinate the water supply and then another six to eight weeks to deploy the chlorine into the supply? Or can the chlorination be deployed reasonably rapidly? I, I heard the tail end of what it sounded like a matter of hours. Is that, is that the case? Okay, so the 60 days is the entire deployment. So from the, from the decision, <laughs> in 60 days' time, we could have chlorination active in the city. But then it's chlorinated immediately once the 60 yeah. days is up. But I think you might have missed the questioning, mm. um, Jamie, that, that said that the reason for choosing the one day for implementing it was so that people who need to dechlorinate, like people who are using dialysis or um, filling a tropical fish tank or producing beer or something, um, they, they, need to, um, they need to be able to uh, dechlorinate. They need to know what date it's going to apply from rather than just a rollout across the city. They need a date. Uh, yeah, no, that is helpful. And I guess this then really comes down to an appetite for risk. And um, from the from a medical standpoint, that may be uh, an unacceptable risk, but it, it follows on, I guess, with what Tim was questioning, was would the medical officer of health be comfortable with us putting in place the infrastructure, and then in the event that um, there was heavy rainfall or was something that we think would heighten the risk to contamination of the water supply to then deploy chlorination, or is there just too many variables there and too big a risk to take with that? The answer is there's just too many variables and too big a risk to take with that. No, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, look, we'll just uh, adjourn for um, uh, five minutes. Uh, well, four minutes. We'll come back at 11.35. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
seats again, that would be great. Um, we've just uh, tidied up some of the resolutions as well in order to sort of pick up uh, on some of the issues that uh, have been raised during the questions. I would like staff to uh, publicly advise of the error and the correction and report um, option two, paragraph 7.8. So, John, if, if you yes. would like to report yes, on that. Bring your attention to uh, point 7.8 on page 15 of the report. Uh, we had left in there the, uh, the, operate, the annual operating cost of temporary chlorination, which now we've put to the front as a monthly operating cost because we're not likely to be chlorinating for a year. So we thought we'd express that as a monthly. So that needs to be amended. 7.8 will read, maintenance slash ongoing costs of 270000 would be made up of $210,000 with a wellhead maintenance and $60,000 for increased water quality monitoring. And that's the new text. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's the cut and paste. Yes, yeah, so thanks to the yes. press for, for picking that up for us, uh, doing our proofreading. Very good. Yeah. Um, all right, so um, thank you. So n now uh, we'll um, move on to the resolution. So let me just uh, note the, the changes to the resolution. So do you want to move up? So we've um, turned uh, four into a request to staff to report um, through ITI, so which will come back to council with recommendations on the um, update on the uh, cost of undertaking further um, improvements um, on monthly progress with implementing the wellhead improvement uh, works with the draft water safety plan for approval when completed and with a review of the inspection regime for the monitoring and assessment of below ground wellheads undertaken prior to June 2017 and since, because what that will do is it will enable us to actually look at um, what the uh, inspection regime was before and after and whether the inspection regime changed, whether the standard changed or whether in fact we didn't have a sufficiently good standard before and is that something that really was throughout New Zealand um, given uh, that it really came to the fore when the um, Havelock North incident occurred in August um, 2016. And if we could move up the list. Sorry? Oh yes, and we've added um, approve the installation of temporary chl chlorination for up to 12 months. That means that if it were um, required for more than 12 months, it would have to come back to council for another decision. So that makes it clear that we're only authorising temporary chlorination for 12 months, up to 12 months. Um, the uh, item number seven is, um, and this picks up the uh, item that was left to lie on the table. Um, that was uh, referred to, uh, that was to be referred to the council meeting on the 22nd of February, and that's resolves that long term, it, uh, yeah, long term, do we have to say it? Long term, um, the council wants to retain its unchlorinated drinking water system relying on secure bore status. Accordingly, the government opposes any government move to what? Oh, oh <laughs> optimism, <laughs> optimism. Accordingly, the council opposes any government move to remove its ability to rely on secure bore status to comply with drinking water standards New Zealand and opposes mandatory permanent chlorination. Um, and then item uh, eight just simply notes that that resolves that matter and staff no longer need to report back on the matter it's dealt with. Um, and then item nine, ask the chief executive to undertake an overarching independent external review of this matter so that the council can provide assurance for the future of our unchlorinated water supply and report back to the council. So that's to the full council, not through ITI, but to the full council. Um, and that's just to pick up on, on some of the issues. So I'm, um, I'm um, willing to move this. Oh, uh, sorry. Can I just uh, say something that I think is important? Um, in light of what's happened with Havelock. Um, the wording as it stands implies that Christchurch City Council would rely solely on secure bore status. And I think 
the case for Christchurch is they have never relied solely on secure board status. There are other processes um, such as the monitoring, uh, the, the rigour of the monitoring program, backflow monitors, maintenance of reticulation system. Right. Uh, and, and that's important, it's a very important point to make because uh, should central government come back to you and say, well, you have said you're just relying on secure bore status, right. you have to say secure bore status and other processes that keep yeah. our waters safe. Yeah. Yep, take that out. To, to rely um, move its ability just opposes any mandatory permanent coronation yeah just accordingly the council opposes any mandatory permanent well but is there a is there a way of signaling to government that we don't actually want them to pick up that recommendation about the secure bill status or or does it matter? Well, you can. I mean, I suppose you can do that anyway. But I think the point is, you've not relied on secure. It's rely on you. You've relied on secure board status, but you have also augmented that with all those other important yeah. processes. Um, do we have solely uh, bit private just before? Yeah. Well, accordingly, the the council opposes any. Um, uh, uh, government um, imposed mandatory permanent yes. coronation. Yep. All right. So, question? Yeah. Just before the debate to start, um, number three, will that be put separately? Uh, it can be if you want to. Yeah, I think it'll make it easy for people to speak to, and uh, I can't imagine anyone's not supportive of all the others. And once three's put, then most of the others fall into line anyway. But yep, I, I won't have it as two separate debates, though. No. No. Did you have a question? Yeah. Well, just clarification on the amendment to number four, because um, I mean. There was comment made that councils can attend committee meetings. That's actually not, it's not in the past, uh, councils have been unable to. It's only for so, the cycleways, yeah. Well, regardless, like, um, so there was comment around whether that could be the full council given the significance, and I thought there was going to be an amendment to that effect. So I would like to either signal an amendment to number four um, in that regard, okay. that it should be the full council, given that there's other committees light finance and performance, light audit and rescue actually do have some role in this and I don't think it's fair just to go to one committee that excludes other councillors because I don't think we really want to get into a detailed debate at council around all these different things. I think they're so significant we should have an opportunity as a full council to consider them. Well, I very strongly disagree with that. I think that it's important to have the lens of the subject matter committee making the recommendations to council who is rather the than staff making committee. recommendations directly to council. But but that's fine. You can you can move an amendment. Yep. You move an amendment that it's to report to full council. To the full. Do I have a second or to that? a full committee of council? There's no seconder. Okay. Failed for want of a seconder. Thank you. Um, so, um, so I've moved the the, the resolution. Is there a seconder for it, Andrew? Right. Well, look, nobody nobody uh, wanted to be in the position of considering a report uh, that contained a recommendation for um, chlorinating our pristine and wonderful water supply. Nobody ever wanted to be in this position um, as a city. We have been in this position before where a recommendation has come before council where we decided not to chlorinate and that was two years ago um, in 2016 and in September a recommendation came forward that because of the um, risks around the northwest shallow bores that it was recommended that we should chlorinate um, in that area and we chose uh, not to do that. 
the uh, focus on the shallow bores arose because of the Havelock North inquiry. It, it was always on this council's agenda for a very long time to stop reliance on the shallow bores and to go for the for additional deep bores in those areas and that is a program of work that's still being undertaken but we have closed off the shallow bores we agreed to do that as a matter of urgency and we brought that uh, work forward there were risks and we decided as a council that weighing up those risks providing people with the information that they would require, knowing that we have an excellent process for testing, um, second to none, because we value our pure water supply, uh, we were able to make that decision. Um, and it was against the advice of staff and it was against the advice of the Medical Officer of Health. But that was the decision that we made. This one's slightly different because we're not just talking about one area of Christchurch that can be isolated. We're talking about losing secure bore status from um, borehead status from bores that are right across the city, 103 I think in total, and of course there are a significant number that are no problem at all because they've all been built above ground since a particular time. But the below ground uh, boreheads do present us with this problem. In many respects it doesn't matter whether it was as a result of the Havelock North inquiry that there has been an increased sense of um, risk and risk aversion in terms of the sign-off of the engineers, but we cannot rely on the status, the secure status of our boreheads, and that is not a risk that I'm prepared to take. And the reason I'm not prepared to take that risk is because although the risk, the probability, the probability is slight, it is unlikely that there would be any event. We haven't had any transgressions in significant rain events that have already been mentioned. So the risk is very small, but the consequences, they're huge. And when you think about the potential consequences, you take an area of Havelock North and the number of people that were affected there, three to five people died and there were thousands infected. There would be hundreds of thousands potentially exposed here in Christchurch and how many deaths could possibly occur. So although the risk is small, I mean sorry, I'm going to say risk is two things, it's probability and consequences. So although the probability is small, the consequences are high. This puts a red flag around the risk for me and that's why I'm moving the recommendation. Andrew. We've heard a lot of detailed information today by way of um, the answers to the many questions that have been put and also the information that was provided in the, provided in the report and in, in previous briefings as well. Um, and having considered all of that information, in my mind, the way forward is reasonably obvious. Um, we've lost our secure status. We need to regain that as soon as possible. And I believe that the steps that we need to take in the in meantime um, are pretty clear. Um, as has been said, the reality is that the risk of contamination is low, but the consequences of contamination could be probably more than significant. Um, we as a council have got a responsibility to take seriously the advice that we've been provided and the information that's been put in front of us, um, and we certainly have a responsibility for the health of our residents, the health of our citizens, um, to make sure that we do the responsible thing to ensure that the quality of our water supply is not a, a risk to um, public health. Adding chlorine to our drinking water isn't something that I'd vote to do lightly, and I do that only in the context of the advice that we've received from the Medical Officer of Health, and I agree to it only on the basis that this is only a temporary measure and that it only needs to be a temporary measure. 
until such time as the wellheads are once again able to be signed off by the engineers as secure. And as we've heard, there are arrangements already in train to allow that to happen. And there's an understanding on the part of the engineers of what the interventions that are required are, and there's an agreement that once those interventions have been completed, then sign-off can and will occur. So I've got a very high level of confidence that what we're talking about here is temporary, will be temporary, and that we've got the ability and the confidence to do what needs to be done as quickly as possible. So I don't support permanently chlorinating the drinking water, and the decision we're making today definitely does not do that. I do support temporary chlorination for public health reasons on good and responsible advice for the shortest time possible and expediting the program of work that's required to achieve that as quickly as possible. So I'll be voting today in favour of the resolutions. I'm just going to go around the table now because it just makes sense that everyone's indicated to me that they want to say something. So, Vicky. Um, I will also be supporting it. Um, I think we're in a situation where we either do this or we get told to do it. I cannot imagine for a moment that the Medical Officer of Health can let a situation where he perceives there to be any risk to public health and he would not act on that. So as I perceive it, we either do this or the Medical Officer of Health will tell us to do it. Um, so it's going to happen one way or another. I think what's really important is that this is a public health issue and I totally get why the Medical Officer of Health could not uh, do nothing. Um, he cannot sit by and watch renal failure in a six-year-old or something like that that could have been prevented. I don't think as councillors we can either, actually. Every day we deal with issues of public safety, we deal with them in cycleways and um, pedestrian crossings and traffic lights, um, everything. Um, so safety has to be one of the things that we look at very, uh, very carefully. Uh, my focus is on making sure that we get long-term safe drinking water without chlorination. And if we are going to persuade the government um, that we are worthy of an exemption, given the recommendations of the Havelock Authority, we actually want Alistair on our side um, to do that. And I want to see that they will want to see and want to know that we will act if there is any possible threat to public safety. So I think long term, I think what we do short term actually impacts our capacity to have an exemption long term as well. I think there are three um, three things in here that, that give me some comfort, um, give me more comfort. One is the addition of up to 12 months in Recommendation 3. One is Recommendation 7, where we actually make clear what our view is about the long-term non-chlorination of Christchurch water supply. And what I'd also like to see, but I don't need by way of a recommendation, because I'm sure staff will agree to it, is that we actually provide some unchlorinated water for those who want it in public spaces, whether it's libraries or whatever else. But I don't think it needs a resolution in order to make that, make that happen. So I will be voting in favour of this. Thank you. Yanni. Um, yeah, I, th I think what's, uh, rather than canvas the arguments that have been put forward or the points that have been made, I mean, I, I don't think any of us wanted to be in this situation. I, I personally value Christchurch's precious water. Uh, and, you know, that there is a responsible course of action that we have been uh, asked to take um, and you know I think to oppose um, putting in chlorine on a temporary basis would, would not be responsible at the moment. Having heard from the Medical Officer of Health and having heard that the assessment of the secure bores that they are no longer secure so I think we do have to make this decision today. I think there's two other questions that really do need to be answered and uh, I think you know the focus has to be as has been said getting our permanent um, uh, uh, sorry getting the temporary chlorination finished as soon as possible um, and allowing our water to be unchlorinated that has to be the focus today what we need to do to get there but there are other things that we also need to pick up on this and that is a full audit review of how we got into this situation in 2003, there were learning points that were identified through a committee, the need to modify some wellheads and other items to reduce risk, the need for improved inspection and testing procedures to identify potential problem areas and deal with them before the problem occurs. So 
you know, 15 years ago, we actually knew that there needed to be improvements, and it will be very interesting in the report and audit that gets done to see what was done as a result of that, what was done after the earthquake, because I think some people will really want to understand with the millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars spent on infrastructure repairs and on uh, assessments, how we could have had such a dramatic change in, in less than 12 months' time, from a system being okay and secure to suddenly being unsecure. I think the other thing that's really important is that the secure bore uh, status is only one way of reducing risk. And I hope that councillors will look at things like the sewerage contamination of our wellheads that won't be covered under this repair program that will be hopefully identified as something that we should also be doing to reduce the risk. So, uh, you know, I would love not to be able to, tr to uh, I, I would love to not have to put chlorine into our water on a temporary basis, but uh, I feel that that is the responsible thing to do. I guess as someone who has a young daughter um, and, and thinks of the health consequences, if even though the risk is low, but the consequence could be huge, uh, I think we need to do the responsible thing today. I would just make the point that this should be going to the full council. Um, you know, I wouldn't expect the Regan Consents Committee, who l lost the accreditation or the council, monitoring the accreditation. It's a full council consequence, as we're seeing today, and it should be the full council that looks at the response, not just one committee, because many other committees, whether it's finance and performance, audit and risk, have a role to play in this. Have already had reports around this, and I think we need the full council taking responsibility. Thank you. Tim. Thank you. Look, first of all, I want to thank um, Dr Alistair Humphrey, um, the DHB and our staff. I think it's an um, exemplar of working together and I think that's the key and I think that that should give a lot of reassurance to everybody in the city. So thank you all for the work you've done. I think that's crucial. Um, I'm totally opposed, like everyone around this table, with regards to permanently chlorinating our water in the city. And I think, as Vicky said, items three and seven add reassurance to, to us and to the city that that will not be the case. Um, if you really look at the, the 60 days to impl implement, if we take from today, making the decision today to temporarily chlorinate our water, we've got 60 days to implement. If we ex expedite the process, which we've also asked our staff to do, we're looking at between seven and nine months. So although we're saying 12 months, we are hoping to get that done as, as um, quickly and as professionally as possible. So I think I'm hopeful that we'll be finished this within 12 months, or well short of that. As also it's been suggested, or said that risk is a combination of likelihood and consequence. The likelihood is very low, however the consequence with a population of 300,000 is extreme. And if we look at the most vulnerable being infants, children and the elderly, and we have a medical um, health system which is pretty well under pressure anyway, what hasn't been mentioned is if we have a health system that is inundated by illness through contaminated water, there are those in our community who need assistance with health that may not get it and their, their life risk would raise as well. So it's not just those that are affected by contaminated water. So I will be supporting this. I think um, item eight, the last one with regards to a review after all this, because I would hate to add pressure to our staff I would like them to concentrate on expediating this and getting to an end zone where Alistair and our staff are happy and can sign off and get back to normal. So, but I think following all this, to have a review is extremely important and that should be to full council as discussed and put up there. So I will be supporting this, but I would definitely make sure that it is a temporary measure. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. I support all the recommendations, which to me, uh, obviously sequential and uh, hugely proactive. So uh, when you look at these here, these will uh, stand as um, part of the paper trail for us looking back. We, why I say that is if you look at any uh, uh, crisis or any, uh, um, you know, the, the Havelock North inquiry and the, the two stages has traced the systemic breakdown. So we are acting now, we're, we're being proactive before we have a public health crisis. And the government will look at this and they will want to know 
from uh, subcommittee uh, onwards that we've taken this seriously and uh, that we're uh, obtaining all the information, getting our reports in place, um, acting. So uh, I've, I'm fully uh, behind this. The, um, if you look at anything that's ever gone wrong, uh, uh, major tragedies in New Zealand or, or uh, uh, public uh, health uh, outbreaks, they can always be traced back to governance and their attendant decision-making issues, uh, management, etc. So the way I look at this today, we're addressing these systems today uh, to head off any uh, mandatory um, uh, treatment, which, which if you look at stage two of the Havelock North report, is pretty strong on the fact that appropriate and effective treatment of drinking water should be mandated by law. Uh, provision should be made for exemptions to mandatory treatment only in very limited circumstances. The way I see this, we have to earn number seven. Okay, we have to do this stuff today. If if you want to be chlorine-free permanently, the short answer actually is you've got to put in place the chlorine treatment now. <laughs> so if we want to build this case, this exemption to the government, we have to be sensible about it. Not everyone wants it, but we've got to do it now and uh, and ensure that we are, are permanently uh, chlorine-free uh, uh, in the future. So that, that's about uh, all I have to say on that, but I urge you to, to please uh, uh, support the recommendations like everyone else. I don't want the water to be chlorinated, but we, we have to think of Christchurch's reputation. We think, have to think of the mana of the council. Uh, we have to ensure that our drinking water remains chlorine-free uh, in the future. By actually chlorinating now. Okay, Aaron. Well, well said, um, Glenn. Um, I'm. Uh, wow, this is this is a big decision, and it was asked before why uh, some of the um, my fellow councillors kind of wish we weren't here, and why we're in the situation. We're in the situation because we put our hand up to be councillors, and sometimes there will be some really, really tough decisions to make. Today is one of those. Um, this council actually didn't chlorinate the northwest, which is where I live, uh, where my three children live, the youngest of which, when you made that decision, was months old. And I applaud you for that. I'm happy, and I'm happy to take that risk. Uh, we did boil the water that our baby had, um, and uh, either that or we gave it Coca-Cola. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but the uh, and that will be if we um, if we chlorinate will actually be one of the unintended consequences of chlorinating the water in Christchurch. Christchurch has some of the most purest, um, beautiful drinking water in the world. And when it starts to taste and smell like a swimming pool, people will opt for other drink options. That will be a consequence. Bottled water sales will go up. That will be a consequence for a council that is anti-plastic in the environment. Um, I've been contacted by a number of constituents in the last few days around this, all asking us not to chlorinate today. All of them. Not one contacted me and said, please chlorinate the water, which leaves me with a bit of a dilemma because we're now uh, risk versus consequence. And every single day, people face, ri face risk uh, in their lives. Uh, when you cross the street, um, just under 40 people a year are killed as pedestrians crossing the street. Um, Havelock North, uh, between three and five people who were very uh, immunocompromised at the time that they contracted that illness. Uh, there's the amount of sugar people have, there's drinking alcohol, there's going to the beach, 115 people a year drown. There's risk in life every single day. And this debate today is about do, are we willing to take a risk with our water as low as that risk may be, but the consequence is very, very high versus the quality of that water and not messing with it. Now, I've heard the debate that we need to stand together with Alistair and the DHB, which I'm a part of, and uh, make a united front that we've, we have made a balanced decision here and come up with the right outcome for our people for this period of time before we get back to our untreated drinking water. That is absolutely true. but. The part of that debate is there's all those people who don't want their uh, water treated. They would rather manage their own risks in life. And those people aren't being um, represented in the debate at this point. But we do need to consider those people because they are so passionate 
about the water of Christchurch. Um, I do agree that we need to be responsible, but by falling into line and being responsible, that doesn't necessarily send a message to the government that we can't manage our water. It may also send a message that we're willing to fight for our water and for our water to be untreated. So let's balance that up as we make our decision. Thank you. And I'll wait to hear the rest of the debate before I decide on number three. Thank you. Uh, Phil? So look, I think what's important is that th this, um, what we're deciding today isn't only around the chlorination, obviously, it's really around accelerating that whole wellhead um, pro uh, repair program. And, and it's a combination of interventions that is, that is going to work so we, re so we um, return to be able to um, not have to chlorinate. So, and I think that it's essential that the partnership um, uh, w with um, the Medical Officer of Health, that that really continues, um, so that in fact Christchurch can be a, a special, uh, exe get a special exemption status. And I think that have it continuing that partnership in a constructive way, that will help give us credibility, not only to the Christchurch people, but also with the government. And I think the, it's been said, but I'll repeat it, there's no real change in the water quality. It is as it was before. What has changed and has become clear today is actually how the standards, the application of those, has been changed um, by, the, by the engineers. And, and we've got really um, no option. Uh, and I think it's encouraging that, in fact, in August, and a, the ITI committee considered a lot of these reports, that, that Christchurch wasn't only compliant at the time, in fact, we were complimented. Um, and Alistair referred to, to that today. I think retaining the, the committee as part of a process that we work through is, is really, really important. I think that that way this, this quite technical work can be focused and, and, and in fact we can become quite effective. So in fact we work with the whole of council. Yeah, Dion. Um, this is a situation that I would not have liked, as, as many of us have said, to be in. But the fact is that we are. Um, if we don't make a decision to, to temporarily chlorinate this water today, we're most likely going to be forced to do it. And that has dire consequences for the future of what we're trying to achieve with our unchlorinated water for the long-term future. I mean, I value the unchlorinated water in Christchurch. I've got a lot more years to live, I hope, and I would hope to live those years with unchlorinated, unchemically treated water. Um, we are in a really good situation where we do have water um, in our city that we can draw on that is naturally treated in such a way that it has low consequences to the drinking that we have. Um, I wanted number four to come back to council, uh, to the full council initially, um, but a compromise that we had was number nine where we said that we're going to have an overarching review of this process uh, so that we can understand why we've got to this point, how we're going to be better so that we can make those assurances to our people in our city and to the government and to anybody who visits our city that when they turn the tap on, they are going to be safe, that they are not going to get sick. And there is no question in anybody's mind about that. And I think that is a very, very important place for us to get to, um, especially in light of recent circumstances that have happened around the country. Um, One of the things that I've been thinking about recently is actually around the testing regime that we do have, and I do wish that in the future we could have very quick testing, such as like five minute tests to understand where the pathogens are coming, and I think there's some good research that I hope one day is going to actually get there so we can actually get really quick testing and then answers about what's in our water so that actually all water suppliers can actually have an instant understanding of what's in their water. At the moment I think it's 24 hours or something along that line. You know, technology's in an exponential curve. I think, you know, we've got a prime research and development opportunities there for somebody. Anyway, I value living in a society or in a, in a city where water is pristine. Um, I, I will support temporarily chlorinating the water but only so that we can get that secure status to make sure that we are doing what we can, everything we can, so that our water can stay um, you know, untreated for its life. Thank you. Pauline. Right, thank you. Um, a lot of what I was going to say has been said, so I'm sort of culling as I go along, but I'd also reiterate, like to reiterate the thanks to um, Alistair Humphreys for joining us with us on this uh, serious issue. 
And also to thank you for recognising that the council staff are doing exemplary work and um, going above and beyond its responsibility to supply and protect our drinking water. And to also recognise John and his team for the work, the proactive work that you have done in this space. Um, so um, we know that we're experiencing far more frequent and more intense rain events and flood events. And it's these events, among others, which are putting our drinking water at risk currently and will continue to do so until we seal these boreheads. And we have looked at every option to avoid this. It's the last thing I ever thought I would agree to. But we are faced, as been said, with low risk, high consequence situation here. But I want to assure you that the ITI Committee, the Infrastructure, Transport and Environment Committee, will actually have a microscope on this program. Actually, we have already done that. We're very aware that getting these bores sealed and our secure status reinstated and the chlorine removed is an absolute priority and to happen as soon as possible. I also want to, um, to note that in May last year, after the Stage 1 report, the ITI committee um, already instructed staff to include water quality monitoring reports into the three waters reports that come in every two months and to include the minutes of the Canterbury Drinking Water Reference Group, which was formed in a response. Um, to receive updates on the program regularly and we requested the council to write to government with their opposition to enforced chlorination those last two are in the recommendation today. Um, it's already been said that the resolution uh, states up to 12 months which gives me some comfort. It's a temporary nature and we would have to revisit this resolution if that's to change. But I also note that the infrastructure required to temporarily chlorinate is, is significantly different than that which would be required for permanent chlorination, with an increased uh, cost as well for permanent. That also gives me some comfort in the temporary permanent concern. So reluctantly, I must also agree to the temporary treatment while we strengthen our multi-barrier approach to our water safety for the people of Christchurch. But we also need to embrace this situation as an opportunity to up our game and, and in the long run we will be assured of the safety of our water and our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Mike. Thank you. Uh, I totally oppose the addition of any chemicals to our uh, pure pristine water. Obviously there's times when water does have to be chlorinated like after the earthquakes. Um, what we do know following obviously the removal of that chlorination, um, there have been no incidents, no transgressions, no problems with our water supplies. Those wellheads haven't changed, they're still the same today as they were before. Obviously the provisional uh, status on our water supply has changed to unsecured, but everything else is the same. When the previous council made the decision to not chlorinate the water in the northwest. That was a good decision. The actual risk of contamination was higher than what we're facing now, um, but obviously fewer people were affected, but there were still thousands of people that would have been affected had there been an outbreak. But you knew that risk then and you made that decision, and what happened? There were no outbreaks because the risk, or the probability of that contamination is so low. Um, we are obviously aware now, it's brought to our attention the problem. I, wanna, I have a few issues with the whole timing of this. Um, you know, the world doesn't stop turning because it's Christmas and we do have a recess committee and I personally think more should have been done. If it's truly serious, it's going to be 90 days from the time it was reported to council by the time we chlorinate the water. I think that is too, too long. Um, and it needs to be addressed and we need to take on learnings moving, moving forward. Um, and I do struggle, you know, when I weigh this up. Um, and I understand if we voted no to chlorinate, what would happen? It would most likely be chlorinated by order. Uh, but we do have a right to make that vote. We're not forced to make the vote to chlorinate. We can allow it to be ordered. I still don't agree with comment that there'll be do desire consequences if we do not vote, if we do not vote to chlorinate. There's no proof in that. Um, that's just a statement without proof. Um, I personally haven't made up my mind, I'm listening to the debate, but our water has been perfect. We've been through a lot, it's remained perfect. People were aware after the earthquakes 
Um, and they took precautions, and no one got sick. We can inform the public, we can give the public the choice of what to do. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. I'm not going to cover ground that has um, already been covered. My uh, bugbear in all of this is um, engagement with the community. Now, we've heard that there is no urgency, there's no imminent risk, the delay hasn't caused undue risk thus far, and a further delay, I believe, wouldn't do that as well. As councillors, now that the decision has come to us, we have obligations under the Local Government Act to take into account the views of our community. And one of the times that we're able to not do that is if there is urgency over a public health matter. We've been told that that urgency doesn't exist. Um, and so we should be uh, consulting with our community over this formally. Um, I know that during the cathedral debate, um, where the numbers were different um, in the consultation to the, to the final decision, it was made clear to us um, in the debate that it's not the eyes, it's not the numbers that matter, it's the whys. And while we have uh, a view as a council that probably the overwhelming um, feedback from the community might be against chlorination, that's just numbers. What we haven't heard from the community is the reasons for that. Uh, I've had Facebook messages and posts, those kind of things. Some. Uh, vehemently opposed, some not opposed to, uh, for, to temporary measures. Um, but what I have also had is phone calls and emails from people who are concerned that they have had no chance for input. Uh, one woman who called me last night concerned because she had you know, uh, only a few hours to be able to put any information together to potentially put a deputation to council, for example. And uh, that's been my concern throughout this. Um, we can't just abdicate our responsibilities under the Local Government Act just because it's inconvenient, it's difficult, uh, it clashes with um, long-term plan consultation processes and those kind of things. Um, this is of high significance and we should be consulting with our community. Thank you. Um, Jamie, I'll come to you now. Thanks for that, Leanne. Um, yeah, this is a difficult one. I I believe that if we'd like to have an exemption in the future, meaning in the long term that we have pure chlorine free water, then I think the fact of the matter is we need to demonstrate today that we'll act and manage risk intelligently, prudently and appropriately. And doing that in, in tandem uh, and in collaboration with the Medical Officer of Health is the way to go about that. Do I want Christchurch's water chlorinated? Absolutely not. But that's not the question. And it would be misleading to suggest that it was without the context. And the context and the reality of the situation is this. If we choose not to chlorinate now, then it will almost certainly be imposed on us anyway. Lose clout, lose credibility, and substantially increase the risk of not receiving an exemption going forward, meaning it could likely result in long-term chlorination. So good decision-making is largely about appetite for risk and risk management. Anyone that's been part of a board or an audit and risk committee will recall even the simplest of those risk management matrixes uh, not giving any decision maker a free pass to ignore a risk that has a low likelihood and high consequence. And that's exactly where we're at. At worst, it puts you in the red zone where you need to take immediate action, uh, and at best, it puts you in the yellow or moderate zone. So simply put, a decision not to do this now, as much as I don't like it, would mean that we've failed as governors. And even more simply put, it's clear that if we want our water to be chlorine-free in the long term, and I most certainly do, then we need to make this prudent, albeit difficult, decision today and support the recommendation. It's done reluctantly, but the right decision more often than not isn't the easiest one. So with a view to the future and a view to having chlorine-free pure water in Christchurch, I very reluctantly will support the recommendations in front of us because I think it's, it's simply foolhardy and putting the blinkers on and letting emotion uh, ride over prudent decision making as a result. So I, I will be supporting these recommendations today. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. Despite having an excellent report in August stating all council supplies achieved full bacterial compliance, a result that I understand has not been achieved before, new engineering assessments of Christchurch wells have revealed some may be susceptible to contamination, especially in heavy rainfall events. There is a slight probability of our drinking water being contaminated, but the consequences of this risk are huge. 
As a council, it is our responsibility to provide safe water, drinking water, and a duty of care to protect our residents, especially the vulnerable, the young, the old, the pregnant, and the immune compromised. The steps recommended in this report, these recommendations will achieve this. Temporary, temporary chlorination, while continuing a very thorough work program and review process will achieve protection for our vulnerable and ensure that permanent chlorination will never have to be considered for Christchurch water. I am particularly reassured by point seven and nine and hope it will also reassure our fellow residents that we as a council are vehemently oppose any move by central government to require us to chlorinate our water permanently. Therefore, I am in full support of these recommendations today. Uh, thank you. Dave, David East. <coughs> uh, thank you. With only a couple of speakers to follow me, um, it's probably been said pretty much around the room. And I do uh, concur pretty much with the, um, the thoughts that Jamie uh, expressed a few moments ago in that uh, whilst we find ourselves in this invidious position uh, and we are taking a, a morally responsible approach, um, should we choose not to, I believe the Medical Officer of Health has no, um, no other course of action but to uh, instruct us to chlorinate anyway. Uh, having said that, um, I am <coughs> impressed with the, the program of works that's proposed, but I would suggest to staff that they uh, uh, produce a, uh, a list of the repair program and the order that they intend to um, attack this repair. And hopefully in, in some fashion or other we may be able to uh, consider a zoning uh, approach to returning to a uh, non-chlorinated um, water in, in parts of our city. I've said before in, in other debates, a fairly contentious issue, that I'd die in a ditch over it, I'd die in a ditch in this one. Perhaps there'd be a few people that want to fill the ditch in before it uh, happens. <laughs> but, um, <coughs> but for me, this is uh, an absolute um, um, prime feature of Christchurch that we do have the, the best water, I believe, almost in the world, uh, and there are um, a lot of precedents that I believe that we can put a case, uh, even if government did decide that they wanted to chlorinate uh, in, in, the, in the country, that Christchurch is unique. We do have a pristine water supply and the processes by which we extract our water, by which we uh, monitor our our extraction and the quality of our water puts us, I believe, streets ahead of, of um, many other municipal municipalities in this country and that uh, we need to retain that status forever and a day. Thank you. Thank you. Jimmy. <coughs> My friend uh, visited me from over, uh, overseas. They always admire me to settle in Christchurch. One expects every day I can breathe the fresh air. The other ones, when I open and uh, turn on the uh, tap water, I can drink the purest water. So they admire it in here. As a local uh, authority and also city council, we have the opportunity and the responsibility to provide good quality of drinking water to the residents. This is our responsibility. But right now, we need to look at the fact. Why is the fact now? Because we, our security status you know, from the water supply have been changed. Changed from the provision secure to unsecure. But how do we to fix the, this problem? So we need to work in, uh, together. I know we all prefer, you know, it's the permanent, it's the, uh, the, the kind of not any the coordinate. We drink the pure water. But, the, but the, in a temporary or in a procedure, you know, we have to through this procedure, we can achieve our long-term goal. But procedure, absolutely, we find the root cause is from all those below ground, the balls or wells, the, the kind of hits, you know, need to be improved, need to, to be the fix. Then that's one aspect, but, but simultaneously, you know, 
because even the the risk, the probability is the low. We all we all are aware, even it's low, but it's not zero. Still, more or less the, the probability or percentage. So the procedure for this uh, temporary coordination of water actually is functioning to reduce those uh, percentage, reduce the risk of this uh, kind of uh, you know, the contamination. So we have to face the fact. So this is a simultaneous way. You know, simultaneous we can do it. And also I'm happy you know, we have time frame. We think that up to the, uh, uh, a year we can fix the lost the, the problem uh, the problem and back to the normal situation we can all enjoy the daily basis of the purest the water the in the world and also the in here you know the, the we take these the two kind of ways first one you know we can uh, back to the provisional security status from the unsecured to the secure the other one we can meet the, the the uh, the kind of standard of the water the, the supply in uh, New Zealand, the standard. Last one, we are all aware the direct general of the, the health, the issue of statement, but we need to continue to review the, this one to keep the quality tenable, the water as pure as water in the world. So I support uh, this uh, uh, recommendation. Thank you, Ray. Yeah, I'll be quick because um, I think all the issues have been covered. But just to um, reference the, the shallow bores in the northwest, it's important to understand the only reason we made that decision is because we could shut off those shallow bores. Yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't have approved yeah. that at all. We That's can't right. do that in this case, even though you know we've discussed it about the, the zones and what have you. Uh, but the wells obviously cover the whole city. I mean, you know, clearly this is a short-term inconvenience, discomfort, uh, annoyance for people, but. You know, water quality is the biggest issue that local and central governments all over the world are going to face over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And what we're doing now, yes, there is short-term inconvenience, but actually we will have a very, very secure water supply system once we've done this. And maybe it takes this type of event to really kick things on and maybe do stuff that we should have done that maybe should have been done in 2003. Uh, or whatever it was, but that will happen. So I think short-term inconvenience, but we will end up with a much safer um, water supply system in the end, and then we'll be back to our lovely um, Christchurch quality water. Thank you. Look, I'll just um, close off the debate. Um, I'm, I want to thank initially councillors uh, for the way that you've participated in the, in the debate today. I think uh, all of you um, have made a significant contribution uh, to, the, to the discussion and I want to thank you for that. I'm gratified that in the knowledge that s someone else would intervene and make the decision in our place, you still chose to make a decision today. And um, I'm also grateful to staff that, that they made the decision to uh, relinquish the delegation that had been made under the Health Act and to restore the decision uh, to the council, even though it's for a temporary measure I think it's really important that it is the council that debates it in a very open way in the, re in the way that we have. I also want to, um, as others have, acknowledge the council staff, the medical officer of health and in her absence the drinking water assessor who have collaborated throughout the process. Last year the programme of work that was in place was good enough to retain compliance and within three months that went to not good enough um, and we lost our secure status. Now I'm not one who says that this is a result of increased risk aversion on the part of engineers or others without evidence to back it up. I'm a very much an evidence-based person and I want to see the evidence one way or the other. Maybe what was being done before wasn't good enough. Maybe the fact that there were no transgressions back then, as there have not been subsequently, maybe that was a matter of good luck rather than good management. We've all said we value our pristine groundwater supply, and I guess this is my challenge to the Council. Um, when we look at the fact that we test more than we legally are obliged to in order to maintain that confidence in our groundwater, 
um, we need to ensure that the inspection regime for our boarheads is also second to none. And that's something that I think that we will get out of this, as Raf has said, um, an opportunity for us to actually consider whether, um, well, we're, we're going to have to live up to the expectation um, in order to go to central government with the absolute commitment to uh, um, re retaining our ability um, to not chlorinate our pristine water supply. So thank you all very much for um, the way that you've participated um, in this debate. And on that, um, on that note, I will put the resolution. All those in favour say, oh, now wait a minute, we want to deal with item three first, which is the um, temporary chlorination um, provision. So I will um, put item three. Um, all those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. Would you like to <coughs> just put your hands up? So Aaron Kewan, Mike Davidson and Sarah Templeton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will put the whole uh, resolution. Um, uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like now to move um, that we uh, go into the, um, that it, we adopt the resolution to exclude the public as set out on pages 37 and 38 of the agenda and page 16 of the supplementary agenda, and that Jeremy Smith, Chair of Christchurch City Holdings, uh, Paul Munro, Chief Executive of Christchurch City Holdings, and Therese Arsenault, Chair of New Zealand Christchurch NZ, be um, permitted to remain after the public um, um, are excluded for item 15 um, and the, yeah, for, yeah, as accordance with the resolution. So um, I'll put that motion. Um, all those, all those in favour say aye. Oh no, sorry. Uh, would you like to second it, Andrew? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> all those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. I propose that we adjourn for lunch and um, come back at...